Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch is the parentheses fan game masterpiece. Actually, let's take a step back. Mega Man, also known as its much better title in Japan, Rockman, Don't At Me, is a series by Capcom that first started releases back in 1987 on the NES. For a while, it was Capcom's flagship series. I mean, they dropped six new games of the same series on one console. That's not something they would do nowadays. The series went on, exploding into several sequels and spin-offs that people adore to this day. I'm gonna look at all these games one day, but today we're arguably going to look at my favorite Mega Man game. And maybe in some ways, this will be the beginning of my Mega Man retrospective. Despite Mega Man being so popular that people considered the blue robot to be Capcom's mascot, nowadays, Mega Man is mostly forgotten. Relegated just to merch and cameos and the such in their bigger titles. Just a shout out in remembrance of what was. So what happens when a beloved series is seemingly abandoned by their original creators? The fans take over. Mega Man is no stranger to fan games. There's a million and one. Often taking and improving upon the original 8-bit games from the NES or exploring areas the franchise had yet to see. Hell, there was even a Mega Man Maker that's still getting updated to this day. But most of these fan games, much like the original Mega Man, are 2D platformers. Mega Man is a series that can really adapt to any sort of game genre, and we've seen that, both officially and unofficially. It's just a series that really lends itself well to that having hundreds of recognizable characters with very specific abilities and powers. You can do so much with this. But what about a first person shooter? And I'm not talking about that time when Capcom tried to make Mega Man Prime. Y'all remember that? And I'm not talking about Super Rockman Adventure. That's... Yeah, actually I guess that is a first person shooter, huh? But I'm talking about one where you can use all of these iconic abilities while shooting it out on these 3D recreations of these maps based off the original games, even taking the ideas from newer games and transforming them into this beautiful 8-bit world. Today, I'm going to tell you about the fateful day that one person said, let's combine Mega Man and Doom, and created one of the most well-known fan games still being updated over a decade after its first release and having an active modding and online scene an explosion that no one saw coming this is a game i've spent a great time playing across portions of my life this is a game that truly shows the love and passion that goes into these projects this is one of the greatest fan projects ever made this is one of the coolest games ever made in general this is Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch. Side note I know that the whole Capcom leak or whatever confirmed that there will be a new Mega Man game coming sometime. I didn't have a place to put in the intro though without killing the pacing. All I can say is that I hope the new Robot Masters are cute. Because let's be honest, that's the real reason to play these games. I couldn't find much for the history of why Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch was made. I mean, I could just go ask the dev on Twitter, but baby, that's called anxiety, and it stops me from doing things that make sense. But I can imagine the creator probably just said, Mega Man is cool, Doom is cool, let's put them together. And of course, this creator is none other than, yep, it's Cutman Mike. I say the 800 other times I've talked about them. They've been around for a while, always seeking and taking an interest in mods that push the envelope. Mods that change the gameplay of Doom and take a new approach. Nearly every time Cutman Mike drops a mod, it's a bit of a blow up. To the ghouls mods that were so popular that it got the attention of big name YouTubers, so popular that it spawned its own genre of Doom mods known as ghouls mods inspiring people to have their own take at horror based Doom mods. This series later got a spinoff by Cutman Mike known as Ghouls vs Humans and that was so popular that people once again took the idea and made their own GVH like mods inspired by it. Catch my hell vs Marines Berserker sometime, baby. Ouch! 
so popular that GVH ruled the Doom multiplayer community, with echoes of it still remaining to this day. Hell, Ghouls vs Humans has even been remade into Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch. Talk about going full circle. To even Cuddy's more recent releases, such as the highly acclaimed Corruption cards, which even I knew when it first came out that it was an amazing idea, and I'm sure most of you know of it through my video, of course. Nah, I'm just playing. Most of you probably know about it because legitimately any other Doom mod channel <laughs> reviewed it with far more views. Though to be fair, with how many updates it got, I might as well delete my old outdated video on it. What I'm trying to say is that Cutman Mike is someone that will give you an experience and will put hard work and love on these ideas, no matter how impossible they sound, until something amazing is brought forth from it. Case in point, Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch version 1 was released in 2010, and while I can't gauge how it was at the time, I can imagine it got quite a bit of hype. Hell, Cut Man Mike even managed to get a demo for it back at the Screw Attack gaming convention. Going into a LAN room to play this back then must have been the coolest thing in the world. Mega Man Bit Deathmatch was originally made for Skull Tag, a source port of Doom, allowing the likes of jumping and other such enhancements. Nowadays, Andrenum hosts it, and honestly, this sentence is kind of a waste of video time because I don't actually feel like explaining the whole Skull Tag Andrenum fiasco. Well, I'm trying to say that this was made in a modernized version of the Doom Engine, but not in the GZ Doom Engine like most modern games are. Also, side note, isn't it cool that these source ports for Doom are actually pretty commonly being used to make games? Like, full-on games. Like, it's actually a viable engine to use for a lot of devs that want to make a retro first-person shooter. And I think that's rad. I mean, why not settle for an engine that already provides incredible movement? While version 1 of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch released in 2010, the game has since received updates over the years, introducing new versions full of new maps, weapons, adjustments, new chapters, and the story campaign. The hype for this have always been prevalent, with people memeing, when's VX coming out, when's version X coming out, and excitement for the new release. And I truly mean it when I say that this game still gets updates to this day. As the latest version of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch, version 6, was released back in 2020. This is a game with over a decade of updates and content being added in, all for the love of the game and the series being represented. I hope that if I can illustrate one thing in this video, it's the amount of love that these people have for Mega Man. Cutman Mike merged both Mega Man and Doom, and managed to create what is in my opinion both the greatest Mega Man game and one of the greatest things to ever be done to Doom. My experience with Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch has mainly been the multiplayer scene, the mods of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. Somehow, someway, 8-Bit Deathmatch has overshadowed Doom in terms of multiplayer popularity and audience, which is kind of incredible. I mean, I've been playing Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch online for around 7-8 to eight years, and the kind of mods that have been made for it are exactly the off-the-wall stuff you can expect from a deeply obscure and secluded community known by very few. Like all the stories I have, like the classes mods that give each character from Mega Man, and I do mean each character, a unique moveset. Like, baby, I could be here all day on that. And that's the relatively tame stuff. And that's not to sleep on the main campaign, because that's what we're here for. And Vanilla Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch on its own, because it accomplishes some pretty incredible things as a story mode, told mostly through arenas. Telling a story I found far more enjoyable than, honestly, anything I got from the Capcom games. Who would have guessed that you would need to play a first person shooter to get the best story these characters will ever get? What I'm trying to say is that a lot of people write off Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch as just, <laughs> it's Mega Man Doom, yeah? And, uh, no, it's not. It's actually your favorite game ever made. You just don't know it yet. With the floor open, it's now I want to talk about vanilla Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. The gameplay, the incredible campaign, everything that comes with the package. So let's get into this. This is going to be a fun one. Get equipped with Jumbo Cornbread, get hard, and get, get ready. ready. Because it's Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. At its core, Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch 
is a project of pure passion and love. But at its core gameplay wise, Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch is a deathmatch arena shooter. And I know by now you're probably thinking, Spacey, what the hell did you just say to me? And let me explain, at least how I understand it. Arena shooters are games based around fighting battles out in an arena. Think of the multiplayer in games like Quake, Doom, Goldeneye, basically how most older shooter games handled multiplayer. There are some newer releases capturing that spirit, but I feel as like if the audience is still rather niche. Instead of having custom loadouts and classes, weapons are instead strewn around the map in set locations. You typically spawn with the measly pea shooter, or I guess lemon shooter in this case, and you have to run around to get weapons. Deathmatch of course is just a game mode where whoever gets the most kills or uh, frags wins, whether it be by hitting a score cap or after a certain time limit. And I'm going to be honest, this is the kind of shooter multiplayer done right. I love deathmatch like this. I have so many fond memories of playing Doom Deathmatch and just running around with the super shotgun and blasting people, finding the rocket launcher and rocketing down a hall. Y'all can ride my rocket. It's just fun. Even if you don't always win or do well, it's rapid paced dopamine blasting that you never feel bad. There's always bursts and moments where you pop off and go, hey, you know what, that was actually kind of clean. You see how I dislocated my wrist to get that one? Jealous. And what better engine to make a game in than one based off Doom? I know this is controversial, but movement basically peaked with Doom, and the adjustments made to it has only made it more interesting and fun as you blast other players with your weapon of choice. And let me tell you, Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch has a lot of weapons. No, I mean it, there are over a hundred different weapons. Taking a ton of different forms from charged attacks, AoE, shields, melee, some that stun, some that reduce visions, others with lingering effects, all with unique ways of firing and handling them. Like I actually can't go into all of these weapons, do you see how long this video is already? Well actually I could, but I don't think anyone would care, which means I definitely should. But I'll be covering a lot of these weapons anyways when I go over the maps later. These are known as copy weapons, or copy webs, which trust me as a maestro player in classes, I heard that term a lot. We'll get to that later. And these copy weapons take the form of weapons that Mega Man would typically get from defeating robot masters, although there are also pickups in the form of items to help you move around the map and upgrades to replicate attacks by non-robot masters the series has seen. Most maps are kind of dedicated to a particular weapon, as they are typically based off of a robot master. And with how many weapons and maps that there are, you always see and play with something new. You might think that a mod loving class based loser like me probably wouldn't know how to use a lot of these weapons, but little did you know that one of my favorite classes gimmicks for the longest time was that they just spawned with random copy weapons. So I've actually learned over the years how to basically use every weapon here without even playing vanilla. Because sadly, vanilla Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch and multiplayer, it's rarely played. And for the longest time, I never really played it outside certain situations. Like, you know, if there was like a hype uh, map pack being dropped. However, there was a group that I'm a part of that hosted pure vanilla Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch, which gave me the opportunity to try it out. And yeah. It was a ton of fun. It's that mindless deathmatch mashing that I love so much. Super fast movement, amazing maps, I'll get to those, action every corner, and the wide variety of weapons makes every game feel fresh. You can play for hours and not see half of the weapons. It's not the kind of game where you can just stick to your old reliable weapon because every map has their own weapons. Well there is the starting weapon, which even though it's kind of garbage, it's good for securing kills after a powerful copy weapon attack. I was kind of surprised how much fun this was, in the sense that I was like, this should be played more. I sadly don't have any footage of the sessions I played with the group, I mean, I could get them, but it's probably better that I don't show it. This was all hosted privately, because even they knew that the Mega Man 8 bet deathmatch multiplayer community actually sucks. But I'll get to that later. One of the most interesting things about Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch that makes it stand out 
is that it's all projectile based. Most first person shooters are predominantly hit scan. In other words, if you're staring at someone with your gun and press the shoot button, they take damage instantly. Most games show the bullets flying through the air to simulate the idea of being shot, but in reality those are all visual flare, the damage comes out instantly. In Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch, the projectiles are the damage. Which I think is necessary, it helps define and separate these weapons farther. Weapons shooting in different patterns, different speeds, some with rules such as crawling across the floor or sticking to walls. It makes every encounter with opponents a unique dance of dodging their attacks and learning their patterns, as if replicating what it's like to fight these bosses in a normal game of Mega Man. I want to merge gameplay and graphics here when talking about the maps, at least the base maps, which there are a lot of, from the campaign maps to some extra ones made for Capture the Flag, and let me just tell you, these Capture the Flag maps, big bangers, I'm not going to be able to talk about them, but they slap. And speaking of capturing, these maps capture the idea of, me of what Mega Man would look like as a first person shooter. As I said earlier, all levels are based on the themes and appearances of the classic levels dedicated to each robot master. These are so well done and faithful that most fans can probably recognize which robot master's map this is just off of a first glance. Despite so many of them, these maps are all unique. And some of them even incorporate gimmicks referencing that of the original level into them, making them even more distinct. And I love this overall aesthetic so much. This is straight up 3D Mega Man. Maps, especially custom ones, are like gorgeous pixel art that you can freely walk around and explore in. I've posted pictures of random maps a few times on my hellhole, I mean Twitter, and that's because I love how this game looks. I live for this look. Like, I've always loved the world and design of Mega Man, and seeing it here in 3D, like this is the kind of world I want to live in. I'm always a fan of bright and colorful worlds, and that's what these are. There are hundreds of maps, and they all look so distinct. This is the kind of game I can never get tired of looking at, and the music helps too. While the original maps play the music that you would expect, custom ones have introduced me to some great chiptune music. Alongside a lot of the newly made tracks for Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch, whether it be 8-Bit remixes done in the style of Mega Man to songs that came out after the 8-Bit era, to original songs in the style to highlight moments of the story, you can think and wonder about how cool it would be if Capcom ever made a Mega Man first person shooter. But I don't think Capcom could ever release anything that looks and plays as good as this. And this is fully shown in the main campaign of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch, telling a story that goes through many arcs and chapters, with surprisingly good writing, and with some lines and moments I will never forget. This is 10 years of love, and the amount of fan service and callbacks in this story puts a smile on my face every time. This is the kind of story that Mega Man fans want. Trust me, the places this story goes, oh, you won't believe. And you don't need to worry about being a Mega Man fan going into this. I know several people who aren't Mega Man fans that love Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. This easily stands on its own. In case in point, I haven't really played that many of the Mega Man games. I just think the robots are cute. But I'll get to that when I do the retrospective some year. For now, we got a story to cover, and I intend on covering all of it. All chapters, all levels with my thoughts and strategies I use. Okay, well, retrospectively, we don't. Whatever. Everything. Get comfortable, because I'm about to take you for a ride. Spoiler warning, of course. I'm going to be 100% with you. You sh. You need to play through this. Like, I feel guilty at the idea I may be potentially spoiling this for some people, because by the end of the campaign, I remember thinking to myself, video games are awesome. And when I think that to myself, you know I just played something incredible, unforgettable. So that's your homework if you so choose to accept it. We'll meet back and discuss our thoughts. And by that I mean you'll just silently listen to my thoughts and then roast me in the comments. 
And you know what? Be sure to pick easy difficulty if you're new to FPS games. But anyways, we starting now? You ready? Let's do this. Starting off, as I said, we have a difficulty selection, normal and easy, which I think should probably be renamed to, wow, that's pretty hard. I can't believe I just grinded a boss fight for an hour and easy. I went with normal, of course, but I was surprised just how difficult this game is. I mean, deathmatch is always going to be a mode revolving around luck. Of course, like something such as a kart racer, if you're good, you'll hit the top ranks, but you won't always win. But I was surprised at how much I lost. Like, I've known these maps for years. I've been playing Doom for, well, basically all my life. But still, sometimes I lost. But in the boss fights, I actually gave me a run for my money a lot of the time. I can't wait to talk about those. I still feel like anyone can beat normal difficulty, but if you don't feel like practicing pattern recognition on bosses for half an hour to an hour, then maybe just hit easy and have a chill time. I don't know the differences between that of easy mode and normal mode because I just picked normal mode and never looked back. And I would look up the differences myself, but quite frankly, I'm just a bad reviewer. The game takes place one year after Mega Man 6. In that game, a man named Mr. X held a tournament to see who was the strongest robot, where scientists all over the world would engage in basically cockfighting. I don't really know why these robots that were mostly made to help humans with labor are now being refitted in a tournament to see who's the strongest. I mean, surely nothing bad can happen from creating robots powerful enough to wipe out cities and kill hundreds, right? Surely that's a good idea, huh? But I guess much like science in real life, morals were never the focus. Regardless, it ended up being a scheme by the evil Dr. Wily, who had disguised himself as Mr. X, and then got clapped by Mega Man, as per usual. Thrown in the slammer too. Now, in 8-bit deathmatch, after the events of Mega Man 6, the real Mr. X has been found by Mega Man, and in order to celebrate this, he decides to hold the second annual Robot Master turn- wait, what the hell? Whatever, what a celebration, am I right? But this time, it's going to be bigger and better. In agreement with Dr. Light, all robots entering are to be refitted with Mega Man's copy powers in hopes to balance things out. Probably balancing things out for Mega Man. All I'm saying is that if things went normally, I'd put my money on Toad Man running around with Rain Flush winning the tourney for free. And is it really a good idea to give all these robots Mega Man's powerful copy abilities? I mean, I don't know about that one, Light. Light's TV ends up getting hacked by Wily, saying that his robot masters are entering as well, which I don't know if how the registration works, but I feel like by now his robot should probably be banned just on the account that they're affiliated with Dr. Wily. Like, I feel like if anyone, Mr. X himself should know that Wily's a problem. Dude, like, stole his identity. Regardless, Wily challenges Light to enter in his robots too. Dr. Light and Mega Man decide that Dr. Wily is probably going to do something evil. I mean, it's about that time. And decide to work together to get as many good robots to join the tournament. Not exactly to win, more or less just to make sure Wily doesn't do anything suspicious. Meanwhile, in the midst of this all, a mysterious robot by the name of Maestro is making their way to Dr. Light's lab intent on entering the tournament as well. This intro is sick by the way. And this mysterious robot here, Maestro, is our main character. Maestro arrives at Dr. Light's lab, who tells us to feel free to look around and talk to the other robots, and that's what we do. Hanging around with Light's bots, you actually give us some helpful tips. You can change Maestro's appearance here too, and I mean, you can basically change it to whatever you like, but I don't know why you would considering Maestro is already really cute. And I feel like as the story goes on, it just kind of messes with the plot in a way that I feel like you probably just shouldn't change Maestro's appearance. Also, I don't exactly know Maestro's canon colors. They're blue here because they've been refitted with Mega Man's powers, changing colors upon collecting different weapons and all that. But if you play with that off, Maestro's colors are actually green and yellow, kind of looking like the normal Navis from BN. Maybe that's just a cute reference. Because I guess after playing through the campaign, I think they're just blue now. Maybe they just thought Mega Man's powers were cool and kept it for the ride. Anyways, it's time we start this tournament. 
We enter the teleporter and lights lab to Cutman's arena, blasting back to the 2010s with chapter one. Cutman's map is nice and small. You can go with the needle cannon if you want the rapid fire hits, but Lead Bubble isn't awful either. Lead Bubble is super powerful, but all the evolution differences and walls on this map can make it pretty difficult to use. Cutman's weapon rolling cut is pretty strong, but also leaves you pretty vulnerable and unable to attack for a bit. There are certain skills about deathmatch that you need to understand. A lot of the time, it's not about winning the 1v1s, rather than jumping into fights and stealing kills, taking notes on who's low on HP and finishing them off. So weapons that can do strong burst damage are a lot more effective than weapons that can potentially lead to your opponent taking your kills. Or well, fine. Frags. Nah, we're just gonna save points. Speaking of which, if you're confused at the layout, Rank is where I am compared to everyone else, in this case being first out of the three other players, while spread is how many points I am ahead or how many points I am behind first. Following my idea of burst damage, I decided to roll with Air Shooter. It's a triple shot that goes upward, so you have to aim down in order to get some better range off of it, hit all three shots and you're good. I actually like Cutman's map. The focus on verticality is nice and the close in design leads to a lot of close combat encounters. I could definitely see some plays being used with the bubble lead down the hallways in multiplayer matches. By the way, in case if you're wondering how this works, the winner is in a first to x points rule set, usually being first to score 10 or 15 points wins the match. If you lose, you have to reset the level and try again, because much like in real life, people only care about whoever got first place. Next up is Gutsman. I just want to say I'm sorry about the view bobbing, this is probably going to affect a lot of people with motion sickness such as I, who is kind of struggling to watch this. Regardless, the idea at Gutsman is to get the drill bomb, it's the best way of dealing with the AI, and I think that would be a good time to explain how the AI works. They aren't the most competent thing in the world, and I'm not sure how much they've changed from normal skull tag slash Landrum AI, they sometimes get stuck, but I do see them go out of their way to get weapons. But whenever you engage with one, they do this thing where they slide around to avoid your shots. And it may not seem like much, but they are really tricky to hit. Like, I am not kidding you when I say that these bots are better at dodging than at least 40% of the people that you play against online. And it's due to this dodging that kind of makes it so you will just not be able to score kills with certain weapons. Anything big and strong and slow will often lead to you wasting your time. And with deathmatch, time is on the essence. I may make it seem like these bots aren't much, but they are very capable of taking wins if you aren't playing at your fullest. I think they give a good challenge, especially for how long this campaign is. But it's due to this robot shuffle, I recommend weapons such as Drill Bomb, as the AOE explosion can really help you with hitting targets. Drill Bomb itself is a pretty cool weapon, holding down fire and releasing to make it explode. Crash Bomb is a little out of the way, but it works too, and Search Snake is always powerful. I also think there's something to be said about all the writing for all these robot masters. They'll talk during matches where you can actually snipe them, I don't know if it's good to teach players how to llama, but we take those. But the characters also have lines for entering the level, alongside winning and losing. And you really get a feeling that there was a lot of care put into all these lines. I would always find myself getting distracted and reading what the characters would say. There's just a really fun personality to it all. Next up is Bomb Man. Bombman's Hyper Bomb is an actual one hit KO weapon that seems to work pretty well against the AI, but I didn't actually find it. I got clapped here pretty hard on my first run through, which is good. Even against bots, this captures that frantic nature of finding weapons and getting points as fast as you can. That's what Deathmatch is all about, fighting the time. And when that respective Mega Man game's boss music begins to play, that means someone is close to winning. And when you hear that music and realize you aren't in the lead, that's when you know it's go time. Magnet Missile's homing isn't as reliable as you may want it to be. Homing Sniper is not that bad if you want to go and get it, but I stuck with the Air Shooter as I did with Cutman's map. It's a nice wide map with hallways to help out the homing weapons, but also condensed enough that you can still get the jump on the homing homies. It's good. Next up is Alekman. Alekman's map is a little meme but has some interesting design. It's a very vertical map with a focus on climbing to the top and using weapons such as Plug Ball and Search Snake to attack those below you. 
The AI actually does this pretty well, though this may be because they have a fear of gaps, leading to them just chilling on edges and shooting down at you. There's also something to be appreciated at how this map captures the vertical nature of the stage from the original Mega Man. I think it's pretty cool to pay homage to the original level in terms of gameplay while still making a playable map from it. Sure, these maps aren't one-to-one -one recreations of the original levels, as these are first-person arena deathmatch maps, but they still retain the same ideas to replicate the feeling of the original level. Because believe it or not, this project was made by people who really love Mega Man. Iceman's map is a very wide open map, where I can imagine the snipings done with the magnet missile you can obtain were all the rage back then. There's an underwater section too if you don't feel like dealing with the homing, so that's an option. Water works pretty identical to how it does in normal Mega Man, giving you jump height depending on how long you are holding the jump button. Definitely not my favorite map, but that might just be because I don't really vibe with the weapons here. And I don't know, big open maps, not the most for me. Skill issue. Fireman's map is great. Icewall can do work with the right setups. Firestorm is a good weapon just to hug people with. Quick Boomerang is a super strong weapon, and Napalm Bomb is always one of my favorites. You might have noticed that I keep dying from missing jumps, and that's called being bad at video games, but you may have also noticed me grabbing Eddie. Eddie's the hookup guy, giving you random weapons just in case if you don't like the ones on the current map. I ended up getting Silver Tomahawk on my second run, which functions a lot like Air Shooter in the way that you have to aim down to get more range, but it's also super powerful. But with Eddie, I can discuss items. There's a lot of items in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch, ranging from classic movement items from the games, restorative E-Tanks, W-Tanks, etc., to calling in Tango to roll some people over, Eddie to carpet bomb some fools, or Treble to carry you to the next level. There's even items to augment your starting Mega Buster, turning into Proto Man's weapon or Base's weapons, etc. This is a small map done right. It doesn't feel very cramped. It's easy to navigate around the whole thing, and action is around every corner. By now, you're probably thinking to yourself, Spacey, this crap is repetitive. Please tell me this isn't how you're going to be for the next several hours. And no, because now stuff gets interesting. After winning this level, we encounter Mega Man. But there's something off about him. He's oddly cool. He says he's joined Dr. Wily's side and offers us to join alongside him. We say no, resulting in us being attacked. This is the first boss fight, or maybe mini boss, of Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch. These are a lot different from normal deathmatch maps, as these have focused and tuned AIs to function how bosses should, having patterns and phases in a dedicated arena. Mega Man slides around and charges his buster. You have Air Shooter and Needle Cannon to help you through this fight. And I'm pretty sure the health respawns, but as long as you pay attention to the buster shots, this fight is no sweat. This fake Mega Man comments on how strong Maestro is, referencing how Wily wants to recruit them to his army, before promising revenge and leaving. And yeah, that's me typing. Maestro doesn't actually speak. I promise you I stopped doing it after the first couple chapters, just bear with me making myself laugh with talking during the cutscenes. I'm... I regret it. It's time for Time Man. If it's not obvious, we're going through all the Mega Man 1 Robot Masters, including the two from Powered Up. Time Man has conveyor belts that switch directions, which can put you into some troubling spots depending on how it switches. The reggae item is pretty useful, putting down a bunch of explosives that the AI has no problem walking over. Other than that, Danger Wrap and Drill Bomb are the way to go. Oil Man has a lot going on. First of all, oil. Oil can be ignited using fire weapons, doing a ton of damage to anyone stuck in it when it happens. You don't get any points for scoring kills that way. And to be fair, I don't know how it would be done in the engine anyways, but it does subtract the score of anyone who dies to the fire, as it counts as a self-destruct. There's also oil canisters that explode from taking a certain amount of damage, and blow up instantly if hit by a fire weapon. One of these contains Flash Bomb, which is a powerful lingering explosion that I recommend, even if it costs a bit of time to get. Oil itself has some ice-like properties to it, as you build up speed the longer you're in it, allowing you to get around the map a little faster. Though you can also use the oil slider to accomplish that. You can find Rain Flush, a powerful AoE weapon, but I wasn't sure how to get it, so don't worry, you'll get your time to shine later. 
I like the party ball place, man. The party ball play uh, gives you random items when you shoot it. And it's placed right near this oil pit, making it like a risky game. Like, should I go for it or is someone going to sit down and troll me? And with that, we beat all the Robot Master stages for Mega Man 1. So you might be wondering, what's next after that? Well, like all Mega Man games, we gotta go to Wily. And by that, I mean Wily's hideout. This level can be tough. I even got my win taken from me at the very last moment. Robbery. That was mine. Hard Knuckle is super strong, but unless the AI is distracted, you will never hit with it. This is like fighting against people, where you can read their movements and punish it. The AI reacts to where you shoot and they will dodge it. And I know you Mega Man 2 fans are kneeling and praying to your lord and savior Metal Blade. Because I guess Mega Man is only good when it plays like Contra instead. But we'll get to that when I cover Mega Man 2. But Metal Blade is pretty average here. It's not a weapon I find too fun to use. But just like in Mega Man 2, it does hold a lot of ammo. I recommend just sticking to Crash Bomb, which is nicely placed next to an E-Tank, which is a full heal if you don't know. This map's pretty cool because it's smartly designed around the weapons, having long hallways for hard knuckles and search snakes, while also having corners for Crash Bomb setups and Mega Ball ricochets. After the match, we'd chill out with Cut and Oil, talking about how much fun they're having getting blown to absolute pieces. We say goodbyes as Maestro is spoken to by a mysterious shadow. I wonder who that could be. Well, actually, you may be wondering too. Not gonna lie, it's kind of hard to make it out in the recording. It's Wily, okay? He tries to recruit us to his side, which I don't blame him, considering the fact that in technicalities to the canon, Maestro just won like seven matches in a row. So yeah, they're kind of a threat. Maestro refuses though, as Wily presses a switch and drops them down a hole. Yeah, maybe it wasn't a good idea to host a tournament arena at one of Wily's hideouts. Oh. Oh no! It's the Yellow Devil. This is a pretty nice recreation of the fight. If I recall, the pieces of the Yellow Devil in the original Mega Man game were completely random. There is a pattern here. I recommend hugging the wall and trying to avoid the ones that come from there. But just like the original, make sure you punish it by aiming for the eye. This all seems pretty familiar, but then, halfway through. Oh snap! There is an indescribable fear of seeing the yellow devil charging towards me that I can't describe. It may be here to give hugs, but Maestro is here to give hands. You got Time Stop and Thunder Beam here. Time Stop is a good way to slow the boss down, letting you finish the job off with Thunder Beam. Hey look at that, you don't even have to spam the pause button to win. And with that, we've successfully finished the Mega Man 1 portion of the campaign. We get teleported back to Dr. Light's lab. I guess Maestro sort of just ends up moving in with Dr. Light. I mean, they start receiving mail throughout the journey, so I guess we do this to live here now. We receive mail from someone by the name of AwesomeFan92. They aren't allowed to say who they are, but they're cheering us on as our new number one fan. Cool! There's definitely more to Light's lab than I've originally shown off. You can find Otto leading us to a virtual training room to help test weapons. There's an elevator leading to a lower floor where you can see neat things alongside... Huh. And some other neat stuff. We talked to Light only to find out that Gutsman has gone missing. Oh snap! We're chill to look out for him as we begin our journey into the second chapter. I don't know about you all, but I got a hunch this may be Dr. Wily at it again. But hey, what are the chances of that, am I right? As we're now in Mega Man 2, Bubble Man stage is the first arena. If I remember correctly, this is the only level that's completely underwater. Due to this, there's some pretty interesting platforming you can do to get around to certain places, grabbing items such as the Treble Sentry or E-Tanks. Bubble Lead works pretty decently enough because the AI doesn't really jump, but I imagine against people, using Bubble Lead to force them to jump and then punishing with another weapon while they slowly descend might be a play. I mostly stuck with air shoot during danger rap. This is one of those maps that's fine against the AI, but would probably be hell in a server with live players. 
Like, they'd probably just call vote to something else. I think it's okay, but it's probably pretty degen. Ooh, baby! It's Air Man. And if you know how I feel about this dude, then you've been following me for a while. Let's just say I'm a fan of the man. Speaking of fans, this stage has a lot of them that blows the players in different directions. And I'm sure y'all are tired of me saying this, but as you would imagine with this being Air Man stage, you know I use that air shooter. I mean, can you blame me? It's basically a shotgun. And we're in the Doom engine, so you know I'm just gonna autopilot and roleplay like I got the super shotgun. There's actually a lot of weapons I enjoy using. Maybe I just got a thing for the close range stuff. I always liked Doom Combat because it was fast enough that just running around with a shotgun was a strat. That kind of explosive one shot, one kill, whether it be by a super shotgun or a rocket, was always the stuff that fueled Doom Deathmatch for me, which might be why I favor the explosive and close range weapons so much in this. You can probably use some items to reach some of the floating islands farther off and get some broken stuff, but I was fine as is. You might think I'm not saying a lot when it comes to these maps, but you gotta understand that I'm only at most of these maps for like a minute before the match is already over, so a lot of talk is based off multiple playthroughs of a map, and nowadays quite a few of the campaign maps just aren't commonly seen. Despite what I've heard others say, I don't think it's any fault of anyone who worked on these maps, it's just that with how people play Mega Man nowadays, it requires less gimmicky maps, but I think this stuff works fine for Deathmatch. I think this is good. But with that in mind, Heatman's map is a classic. This map rules. It's a great blend of these high up areas alongside the lower floor and the battles that take place between them. It even integrates the Yoku blocks that Heatman State is very well known for. By the way, if you skip the Yoku block segments with the Rush Jet, I'm gonna be honest, you're weak. And yeah, I'm judging you on that one. And I know everyone who says Mega Man 2 is their favorite skipped it. Mega Man 2 fans blocked on sight. You might think I'm stalling out with this pointless commentary to show off more gameplay of this map, and you're correct. Atomic Fire fits that category of weapons you'll never hit the AI with. And this ain't no skill issue. I play Fire Maestro on CBM and I roast people all the time with it. These long charge up weapons in general just suck in deathmatch for reasons I've already explained. Wave Burner is a pretty great weapon though. You'll see this one a lot. Great map. Flashman's map is kind of a meme map. It's very small and a lot of fights kind of just end up being in the smosh pit in the center. And while it may seem to be the smart thing to stand on the sidelines and shoot into the crowd, that's weak. And yeah, I'm judging you if you play like a Pop-Tart. Sideliners, out of here. Uh, ignore the footage, ignore the footage, okay? <laughs> Despite what I said about charge weapons sucking, I actually like Pharaoh Shot. It's got a huge hitbox and does splash damage, so you actually can hit with it. And it's just a pretty fun weapon. Though jumping in the crowd with Quick Boomerang is a good time too. Upon winning, I'm notified that a hidden challenger is approaching. What? Who? Oh, snap! It's Anchor! Anchor's from the Game Boy Mega Man games, but also appeared as a DLC boss in Mega Man 10, and his theme there, which plays here, Slaps. Anchor is also part of a group known as the Mega Man Killers, Wily specifically making them with the purpose of killing Mega Man. They even have their own numbers dedicated to being the Mega Man Killers. Which is pretty silly actually, but whatever. The fight against Inker is pretty simple. When he holds his barrier spear, don't attack him, as it charges up his mirror buster that he'll blast you with. That's really all there is to it. Upon beating him, we actually get his weapon for the rest of this chapter, which I consider to be kind of a downgrade, as I didn't really find this weapon that relies on you getting attacked first to be useful, so it just became filler to cycle through on the weapon list. Though it does have one specific shining moment we'll get to later on. Quickman's map is also kind of a meme map. It's basically just a large box with smaller box sized rooms separated by small hallways where the infamous force beams fire out, ready to instantly kill anyone in their way. And if you skip the force beams with time stop when you played through Mega Man 2, you are once again weak. And Mega Man 2 is your favorite one. Out of here! I used whatever weapon I could, like for some reason when I used the wild coils I used it like a shotgun, and as I watch myself proceed to run up to enemies and try this every time I get this weapon, I'm gonna be honest I feel slightly disturbed looking at this footage. 
Woodman's map is great, having an outside area and a cave area, just like in the game. Nice open areas with differing elevations for some dynamic fights to go down. Grab your drill bomb, grab your air shooter, it's gonna be fun. You may have noticed by now that I'm fighting robot masters that are rather tall slash wide. And what you gotta understand is that gameplay wise, all of these robot masters are just maestro skins. And what I mean by that is that everyone shares maestro's hurt box. So if you don't know this, you often find your shots going through these characters proportionally larger than Maestro. This doesn't count for boss fights of course. So in other words, if you want to win, you're gonna have to use the tried and true method. Aim for the dick! Crash Man, a very vertical and small map, very interestingly designed. Here's one of the many times I'll have used a treble sentry item. It's an invincible sentry that just guns people down and the AI doesn't get out of the way of it. Whenever there's a map with it, it's gonna likely be your main weapon to give you the win. But once again, Crash Man's weapon's pretty good too. Metal Man's map is neat, having treadmills to slide you around, and being a very thin map with a lot of cramped hallways, perfect for bouncing Gemini beams. A lot of weapons work pretty well here. This is a cool one for sure. So you may have realized that we actually covered all the Mega Man 2 Robot Master levels. So what's next? Here we go. Dr. Wily Stage 1 is the memeiest map of them all. But I like the visuals. You can see the dragon flying around in the background too. But this is a very wide open map where basically every player can see each other often resulting in you getting blasted from all sorts of different elevations and directions. It's definitely a pretty cool war zone like map in the terms that you just always see someone fighting. Luckily I remember from past experience if you grab some item once and head to the top, you can grab a super weapon that you very rarely seen put, put on maps. Think of it like going out of your way on a deathmatch map to grab the BFG. And you can be sure as hell in online play this weapon was protected at all costs. It's lightning bolt. You freeze yourself in place, hit the lightning bolt, and are surrounded by lightning. This weapon seems to two shot everyone. It's powerful. You use it to skip this nightmare. Other than that, I love the ballet cracker. As you would imagine, lightning bolt probably isn't that amazing in online play because if you see someone using it, you're just going to back up or take the hit and then proceed to blast the player using it as they're frozen in place would still be really good if you see players distracted by fighting each other and you just get the jump on them. But if you see someone with a yellow pallet running around the map, you know it's time to start running. After beating the level, we're treated to a cutscene with some of the other robot masters talking before leaving, a scuffle between Crash and Woodman resulting in a secret wall being opened to us, leading us inside Wily's base. This level's important as it marks a pretty pivotal moment in how I will view Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch going on, so pay attention. We explore the core of Dr. Wily's fortress, finding what seems like several clones of Gutsman, including this one which is called- oh, wait that's the real one. We wake him up, and having plans of getting out and going back to the lab, we do just that. Whoa! So we follow Gutsman, and I'm gonna be honest, this next moment just speaks for itself. This is a really cool fight. Basically you have to wait until Gutsman uses his super arm to throw a rock at the Guts tank, stunning it and allowing you to jump on it and deal some close range damage to the forehead. Though you don't have to wait for Guts if you don't want to. Remember how I said that Mirror Buster had one specific moment to shine? It's here. The damage done by this weapon is wild. This fight's awesome. In the end, the tank is no match for us. We celebrate our victory until the boss comes back and rushes us when suddenly Oh 
my god. That was awesome. And it was seeing this moment here of these characters interacting with each other that that hunch came to me. If you know me, I've talked about this feeling I get. That feeling that I know that what I am about to play is something special. This is where it came to me. This is where Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch really grabbed me. Chapter 1 was definitely a bit of a slow start, but trust me when I say that the train has started and it will not stop until we reach our destination, the end of the game. This is only going to get better and better. If you have not played through this yet, and this looks like something you'd like, I implore you, go and do it. Back at Light's Lab, we read some more fan mail from quite honestly our only fan, and talk to Guts, who explains a riveting story on how he got captured. Incredible. This game is surprisingly funny by the way. We talk to Dr. Light, who sets his suspicion upon all these events towards Dr. Wily. He urges us to explore Wily's arenas more to find some potential secrets, thinking that what Wily may be planning is a lot bigger than just rigging the tournament. Before leaving, Gutsman makes notes of us opening the door during our escape, only to be confused that we didn't, meaning that someone else must have. Interesting. Hey, y'all ready for some Mega Man 3? Snake Man. I see this map quite a bit, but I'm kind of middle on the road on it. This is also when I disabled automatic weapon switching in the menu, because let's be honest, automatic weapon switching is kind of whack. I also set CL underscore identify players to false way earlier. This is because it kept identifying Maestro during cutscenes, which I found to be pretty distracting. I recommend doing that too. I don't know what it is about this map I don't vibe with, but I think it's perfectly fine. A little cluttered in places, but it hits the theme well. Also gives me an opportunity to use Flame Wheel. This weapon is pretty cool. Or should I say, hot. <laughs> Top man. This map rules, the aesthetics, the size, the different places, I think it's great. Top Man's weapon is also pretty dope, but it's pretty sickness inducing, so I'll try not to show it too much, which basically means I'm out of footage for this map. Nah, I'm just playing, I'm playing. Eddie Bomber carries pretty hard here too. Also even got to use the bass upgrade here. I remember thinking this was the coolest thing when I first played this years ago. It's still pretty fun to use, just with how much it fires. There's also a treble sentry you can get, so needless to say, this is just an item kind of map. Edelman's map is another banger, having four rooms separated by tiny hallways, the one intersection in the middle leading to a lot of encounters. This is where you'll find the real power of lead bubble come into play. Also lost like four to five times on this map, not sure why, but I just got washed on this map more than I did the others. Cool map regardless. Each of the four rooms being their own distinct mini arenas to fight it out in, it's awesome. Hardman's map is next. The game notifies me that I got some new mail, but at the time I wasn't aware that you could just return to Light's Lab anytime you want with all progress saved by pressing new game, because new game actually continues your current adventure, which auto saves. Like you can't save manually. Listen, if you play Doom a lot, that's weird. I always play this map in a pretty degen way. Like I don't know, I'm just a pretty sick person. I just grab the star shield and just run up to people and start hugging, and if I don't spawn near the star shield, I just grab the power stone and do the same thing. This is what years of playing Maestro and CBM does to you. It's not pretty. Or with how I treat everything like a close ranged weapon, this is what years of Doom PvP multiplayer looks like. I enjoy this map, but maybe it's just because I like shield hugging. Another easy win for Maestro. Where we going next? Oh snap, it's that purple scarf Mega Man guy again. Man, this guy really thinks he's cool, huh? I know some people who really like him though. He tries to recruit us again, and buddy, you really gotta stop with these Jehovah Witness tactics. I'm good. Our battle begins. 
There's two copy weapons you can use, Power Stone and Lead Bubble. In other words, there's one copy weapon you can use. I mean, if you want to die, I guess you can use Power Stone. But it's there for a reason, as Mega Man grabs them and starts using them against us. When he gets Lead Bubble, it's time to dodge, and when he gets Power Stone, it's time to run. Watch out for all the monsters that attack you if you stand over the green tiles, which were actually pretty neatly foreshadowed in Hardman's map, as we're still in the same environment. This fight's not too tough, and if your health gets low, focus on surviving, because recovery orbs do respawn here. Try not to get cornered by him when he has Power Stone, because it is powerful. Just run and wait for that phase to be over, because he can take all of your health instantly. And the last thing you want is this dude saying, get wrecked after beating you. Youch. We take him out, as he once again swears revenge upon us. Gemini Man's map is a pretty interesting map. Gemini beams are everywhere and it kind of becomes a mess of getting hit by them. You can find Electric Shock, which is an awesome copy web. Jupiter Player's D and I, by the way, you aren't welcome here. This level has some AI favored weapons, like if you run up on an AI and they have Ice Slasher, you might as well turn around and find someone else to fight because you aren't going to win that one. There's an only water portion of the map too, with several ways to enter it, leading to a separate arena to fight in. You can even get Rush Marine here. This is the only time I ever got it. Neat. <laughs> Speaking of which, you can also get Spark Chaser, a weapon so new to me that I've never actually seen it before in 8-bit deathmatch. Needless to say, it's definitely one of the coolest weapons programmed into the game. I won't lie, this is definitely a DJ kind of level you'd probably get angry about in an online match just due to the weapons here. Magnet Man's map is a classic. It's basically several rings to fight on, tons of places to travel and ways to travel to the inner and outer rings. I don't entirely mess with the weapons here so I had to roll on Eddie for the hookups. Thunderbolt does have a good hitbox and Triple Blade is alright but will truly shine later on. Oh sorry, had to bring up the console here because Junkman made a Death Note dub reference and I had to check because I couldn't actually believe it. Sparkman's map is hilarious. Super small, I just grabbed Napalm and got an incredible score streak. I love Napalm man. And I also love his weapon. And I hope this footage shows why. You can also go to the bottom floor of the map to score a Slash Claw, or as I like to call it, the Maestro Backhand. Super satisfying to hit with, and you basically melt anyone you slap. Definitely a funny little map. Take me here every day of the week. Shadow Man's map is great. Even just from visuals, I'm a big fan of the large center area. Remote Mine is also here, a very satisfying weapon that projectiles follows your mouse's movements. Sticky someone and hit that right click to detonate. Yeah, some copy weapons have alt fire functions. You can also get break dash if you want to bonk some people. It's not quite the bowler bonk experience, but still pretty good time nonetheless. Skull Castle Courtyard is another claustrophobic map. Getting the high ground with search snakes is a good idea, but generally maps like this are a bit overwhelming for people like me. This one took a bit, not because I lost or anything, but because unlike the other maps, this one is actually a first to score 20 instead of 10 or 15. We take the win though, and in the after hours of the empty arena, a cutscene of Sparkman altering one of the teleporters is seen. He jumps in, where it reveals that Maestro was watching the whole time. You know what? Maestro, you're a pretty funny person. I like them. We give chase, arriving in a new area where we overhear a conversation between Sparkman and a doctor. A doctor? With Sparkman? I wonder who that could be. It's Dr. Wily, come on. Dr. Wily is upset with how long it took Sparkman, as they both humorously reference how the last map just randomly had the highest frag limit of any other map in the campaign. That's cute. This might be my favorite Dr. Wily quote, I won't lie. Sparkman restores power to the lower laboratory as they run off, with Wily intending on getting some old data files. We travel deeper to find the two at a computer, with Wily roasting the TOs for building arenas so close to his fortresses, and yeah, I don't know what they were thinking either. The computer scans Wily, giving us the big reveal, which even though it's obvious it's him, it's still a pretty cool entrance. Dr. Wily gets his schematics on his ultimate weapon once more, which Mega Man 3 players may be able to recognize pretty well. We got movement here, and I know what you're thinking, but no. I don't know why, but you can't shoot here. 
Maestro has no interest in blasting Dr. Wily. And don't give me that whole robots can't kill humans thing, because that crap makes no sense. Who's to say that Maestro or their creator follows the law of robotics anyways? I don't know why Maestro just doesn't load up their god dang buster, point it at Wily, and da! I guess Maestro's just a small old pacifist. You can't blast Sparkman either, and I'll be honest, I wouldn't want to anyways. Me and Sparkman actually go way back. We're cool. I ain't got no beef with Sparky. So with that in mind, let's try confrontation. Sadly, Shadow Man finds us out immediately, alerting the doctor who unfortunately got everything he came here for. Shadow Man readies his escape with Wily and Sparkman, but Maestro in perfect position. Nah, I'm just kidding. They just sit there completely aloof and watch them get away. I love Maestro. We move on ourselves when suddenly... Oh shoot, it's the Doc Robots. The Doc Robots hold multiple powers of previous Robot Masters and uses them to attack you. This fight is extremely clever because it sort of replicates fights that would happen with these Robot Masters normally and how they would work in a 3D environment which is such a neat idea. But even cooler, the Doc Robots mix these attacks together as halfway through the fight such as Woodman Heatman variant turning the leaves on fire and flame dashing into you. Upon defeating one of the Doc Robots, they drop their weapons, increasing your arsenal as the fight goes on. This is an excellent fight, but the other boss battles in this end up being so much better that this one isn't even that much of a standout, which is definitely something to be said about that because when it comes to Doom Engine bosses, this is easily the best of the business just here. Like, circle strafing isn't going to save your button on any of these fights, and it's quite obvious this was made by people who are extremely knowledgeable about Doom and how to make fights like these work, and how to make them interesting, not just hold strafe and fire. When I say that Capcom can never make something as carefully crafted and loving as Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch, I mean stuff like this. This isn't just taking something from Mega Man and showing it off in 3D. It takes its own spin on it, adding new phases to these otherwise forgettable fights from the original game. Regardless, we defeat all four of the Doc Robots. We didn't even have to replay a bunch of the same levels over again to do so. Imagine that! The underground facility is about to self-destruct, so we Wombo warp the hell out of there and back to Dr. Light's base. Ending Chapter 3. Back at Light's lab, we receive some rather strange mail written to someone named Ray Bluewilt. It discusses the development of larger robots, and if it's not obvious, this was written by Needleman. And buddy, I think he got the wrong address. In fact, <laughs> he may have actually sent this to the worst possible address. We tell Light about what we saw Wily doing, who considers that we should get Cossack's robots on our side, who are also in the tournament. However, Iceman interrupts to say that they already tried talking to Cossack's robots, but things didn't go down well, with them saying that they've already betrayed Cossack and decided to go down with Wily instead. Hell, they don't even know where Cossack is, leading to Light asking us to look around the Cossack arenas to try and find him. And Light, buddy, I don't have control where the tournament matches are gonna be. Just be thankful that we happen to be on Mega Man 4. Alright, let's rock to chapter 4. Pharaoh Man stage is... Uh... Wait, hold on. This isn't how I remember it at all. Yeah, I guess it got updated recently or something. With some fencing on the outside area, new geography entirely, and some changes to the interior too. Here's some footage of the older version. I have to say, the newer one is a lot better. Older version was just a pyramid with the surrounding area being small platforms and sand. And due to the disadvantages present from both elevation differences and the sand which heavily slows you down, I feel like not many people, including myself, actually bothered fighting on the outside. 
but the new version, big improvement. There's more structures to the outside areas, alongside more ground to stand on. Furthermore, the new area outside is cool too. It's definitely a good map for a lot of players. I was pretty okay on the older version, but now I definitely like it. I also like the weapon choices too. Pharaoh Man's weapon, Dust Crusher, Drill Bomb, and they even got Hornet Chaser, the weapon of one of my favorite robot masters, Hornet Man. And let me tell ya, it may be hip to screw bees, but it's hot to screw hornets. I always loved Hornet Chaser because you don't really have to aim. <laughs> That's gotta be the skillless thing I ever said. The homing distance on the bees is pretty small, and they're slow enough to be easily outran, but that doesn't mean I haven't squared hundreds of people with this weapon. It's really good against the AI since they don't really react dodge to it, but it's not very good for deathmatch. It will win you the 1v1s, but it will just do it very slowly. I'd recommend it on levels where you don't really jive with anything else on the map. Diveman's map is really cool. You can platform the whales. I don't mind the water sections as they're pretty narrow and I enjoy the above ground sections as well. Diveman's weapon has some good homing but it's kind of weak and you need to actually be looking at the opponent to use it. So I stuck with Wayburner on this one. If all else fails, you can try bargaining with Eddie. Overall, a pretty good map that I ended up playing a lot over the years. Drillman is a gorilla type level. Super closed in, consisting of several small rooms and basically only explosive weapons. So needless to say, I had a blast with this one. And I know what you're thinking, Spacey that pun was hilarious. And it was. It makes me laugh every day. But it also means that this map is pretty easy to win on. I mean, I won by plus 10. I don't have a lot to say on this map, it's pretty simple, but I like it. Also, hey, a hidden challenger? Let's see who it is, let's see who it is. Aw, oh, it's Punk. Get a load of this one. Okay, so this fight was kind of tough. I didn't really understand how to dodge the jumping screw crushers until the end, where I realized you strafe the first one and stand still for the second one, but then I never understood how to dodge the rolling punk ball. So needless to say, I got punked. Mm, punk? You can screw crush me any day of the week, buddy. But as it turns out, you only have one try at this fight, so uh, I guess I'll hold that L. Which is a shame too, because Screw Crusher is a powerful weapon, especially against non-living things, aka the AI. But whatever, skill issue, I guess. I like Toadman's map. It has several rooms all conjoined to one another by a water current that runs throughout the map and into a death pit. If you know the map well, you can use these currents to boost yourself to certain areas or just cruise around on the rush jet. With this being Toadman's map, you even get to use Rain Flush. What a powerful ability. I mean, I assume you get to use Rain Flush. I didn't actually find it, but I'm sure it's somewhere. I just ran around with Air Shooter. You know me. Dustman's map is full of weapons that at the moment are pretty unfriendly against the AI. I'll explain what that means later, but for reference, me who plays Firebender Maestro in CBM, I'll explain that one later too, was getting clapped when I was trying to use Magma Bazooka, so you know something is up. Rebound Striker is basically my only hope. It frags in three hits, and bounces off walls too. Flame Blast is alright because the AI makes no attempt to dodge it, and I've always been a fan of Dustman's weapon. Ringman's map is a weird one, but it has a lot of different weapons. I got a pretty sick score streak. Like, I know it's just bots, but dang, let me have something. I felt cool. So you can clearly see I basically speed ran this map. Thunderwool is a fun weapon. I'm not sure if the cloud or the lightning does more damage, which I know I can easily test, but remember, bad reviewer. It's a fun weapon to use regardless, and I like the idea of spacing it so it's above your opponent's head when it activates. Flash Bomb is here too, which is great, but as you notice, this level doesn't really have any outside walls, making it kind of difficult to trap and corner people with it. This is a relatively donut, dare I say, ring-shaped map with two elevated inside areas. I noticed Astro Crush on one of the pillars, but I kind of just never got to it. We'll get into Astro Crush later. Skullman's map. So right off the bat, I probably used this clip already, but Gutsman just hits this incredible Ultra Instinct play. Like this is what I mean when I say the AI has some wild reaction dodging. Maybe it's just something you have to play to experience, but sometimes it just feels like this. And I know you Mega Man 2 fans are probably crying and screaming in fear at the idea that Metal Blade's somehow not absolutely doing everything for you. But buddy, it's time we practice some independence, okay? You can't let Metal Blade control all of your decisions in life. It's not healthy. We can be better. Anyway, so Skullman's map. 
Open areas on both sides of the connecting hallway in the middle. This hallway with the lead bubble was basically made for it. But if you go to the area likely nobody bothers with, you can score an ultra setup in the form of Skull Shield and Slash Claw. Skull Shield makes you invincible and allows you to tank one hit, and it can be activated while you switch to other weapons too. Mix that with the Maestro backhand and the alleys full of corners and you got the premium back scratching experience. A nicely enclosed map with a lot of weapons I like. I don't have a problem with this one at all. Bright Man's map sucks. Against AI. There's a large open area that takes most of the map space up with several different areas to shoot from, but I just found none of these weapons to really help me out. AI didn't really fall for my ice wall setups, and atomic fire is just one of those attacks you don't hit against the AI. Your best bet is just to join in the center with everyone else, spamming Eddie Bomber and Screw Crusher. This is Screw Crusher by the way, rapid fire bouncies. It's good here, but it will see farther effectiveness later. You actually shoot the little light bulb enemy flying around, and just like in the game it causes the areas to go completely dark. I would imagine it's not very helpful in single player. This map wasn't hard or anything, I only lost once to Sheep Man, which let's be real. Sheep Man do be spitting some real facts at times. Me and Sheep Man, we go way back. I know there was a time where people roasted my mans, but that's no longer. Sheep is in, sheep is up, baby. You know, maps like these make me nostalgic. I've been refraining from using this term a lot when describing these maps, but back when I used to play deathmatch FPS games with friends in school, we would always call the areas where everyone would naturally gather and fight the war room, which doesn't make sense when you consider what a war room actually is, but that was the thing. We'd always be like, like oh come on, come on, meet me in the war room, fight me in the war room. Maps would just be us gathering our weapons as we magnetically journey our way to the illustrious war room, prepared for combat. Memories like that just makes me think of how deathmatch maps are carefully designed with stuff like that in mind. Areas for players to funnel into, arenas with multiple entrances to result in natural fights breaking out the most in these locations. So we're done with all the robot masters, so we're going to go to Cossack's hideout. Cossack stage? is a giant war room. You're basically getting shot at from all directions. You need to stay on the move. The only safe spots are in the snowy outside areas, but that's just asking to get cornered. I hope this footage shows why I don't really find dive missiles to be useful in deathmatch. I feel like I'm poking a bunch of people in a crowd. I stuck with Drill Bomb, Dust Crush, and Pharaoh Shot. I nearly lost this one, but I made a huge Drill Bomb comeback. It was rad. After finishing the level, Maestro finds themselves cooling it with Drill and Ringman. They tell them that Cossack isn't here, and they don't follow him anymore, now teaming with Wily. Maestro doesn't believe in them, so Ringman tells the truth. Even though Cossack got his name cleared after the events of Mega Man 4, he was forced to work for the Russian government in order to pay for the damage his creations had caused. Being left behind, his robots were approached by Wily and decided to join by his side, entering the tournament to prove loyalty. Suddenly a god dang whole army shows up, likely the Joes and big robots referenced in the letter. They, at Wily's request, are here to terminate Maestro. Drill Man digs a hole and Ring Man bonks them in. Whether it be an escape plan or not, Maestro is now in the trash compactor. The Joes send in one of their muscle robots to obtain proof of Maestro's termination. Alright then, let's do this. Damn. Snatch up that data disc, we'll need it later. The bat catcher tries to give you the yoink, and will pull out objects from the ground, such as med tools to attack you, and junk walls, which if you're caught lacking can quite literally insta-kill you. The junk walls are important because they drop a couple copy webs that will be important to the fight, most notably Thunderclaw. Dust Crusher proves to be very powerful for this fight, and when the boss gets low on health... Yeah, daddy's home, met daddy. So now you're dealing with more from daddy stomps, catcher's walls, and the minions running around. 
You can score Rain Flush to help you deal with the Schmallows, but I generally recommend not using all of your copy weapon ammo on the first phase, so you can have some more firepower in phase 2. It's a bit confusing at first, but when Met Daddy does this EX ground pound, creating a tidal wave of damaging garbage, you need to use the Thunder Claw to swing on the Met Catcher's Claw. Rain Flush in general is good just for attacking everyone. It's probably the best to get rid of the catcher first as they're pretty low on health already, and you don't want to get schwacked by a junk wall when you aren't looking. This was such a cool fight, especially for the first time, with there being multiple twists thrown at you. Some banger music too. Maestro claps the competition and pieces out back to Light's lab. No, I'm not skipping anything, they just teleport back. We're done with Mega Man Fart. Our awesome fan 92 tells us that Cossack robots were probably holding back and warns us these next maps are gonna get gimmicky. But baby, that's what I'm all about. We report to Dr. Light and hand him that data disc from earlier. Through it, he prints out a store receipt via email, revealing a bunch of random stuff Wiley has been buying. This is where we also understand that Ray Blue Will is just Albert Wiley. So we track the address to find Wiley's new hideout and new metropolis. Yeah, it's Mega Man 5 time. Mega Man goes off to handle Wily himself while we handle the tournament stuff. He's kinda sad that he's gonna miss the matches, but like, does the tourney still matter? By all means of the canon story going on here, Matro has not lost a single match. They've gotten first place every time. Like I don't think there's enough matches left for anyone to make a difference. I guess it's just fighting for places below first. I don't know how this tourney stuff works, I'm pretty sure Matro can just do whatever they want now and still hold that W, but I guess they just want that perfect win streak. And honestly, I respect the grind, buddy. I love Charge Man Stage. There's nothing special about it, and there's been better train levels done in custom maps. It's just a single hallway with another level above it, but I just love train levels. Also, Choo Choo, here comes the Frag Train, is a godlike line. Windstorm is pretty strong. It's basically just Lead Bubble, but with the pop up. Screw Crusher is here, and we already know it's good. Charge Kick is fun, but maybe it's more of a movement tool than anything, and if you get overzealous with it, you're gonna sleep yourself. There's teleporters around to help with traveling this level, alongside ladders and several of the carriages to help with going to the top areas. Ice Slasher is a pretty strong weapon too. Train levels are dope. Stone Man is a total classic, just a great map all around. Every room layout leads to some sort of interesting encounter, and the different ways to reach these rooms make exploration very free, such as this big area here, having three entrances and an emergency teleport in the middle in case you're feeling cornered. This is the top one, it's great. Napalm man, another banger map. I thought these maps were supposed to be gimmicky awesome fan. I knew it was just sling for rad. Napalm bomb is here, which is super satisfying despite the range. Flame Wheel is good for damage and great for moving around. Always loved it as a firebender maestro myself. You can find Plant Barrier, which is a shield that recovers HP. Sort of situational for deathmatch considering there is already heals out and about, but trust me when I say it will have its shining moment sometime in this video. Though honestly, the best part of Plant Barrier is that it changes your palette to a super cute pink and white scheme. Screw green yellow maestro, screw blue maestro, pink lemonade maestro is the canon in my eyes. The placement of napalm bomb in the middle of the fighting means picking it up is going to lead to bombs being thrown, and it just so happens it's next to the area everyone gathers to party. Love this one. Wave man? Ah hell yeah this is one of the best. People probably hate the hell out of this map but I think it rules. I love the aesthetic in general, I always like the idea of these robots being stationed to work at these facilities just in the middle of the ocean, like buddy, this view is great. But besides that, we have these wave rider homies to help us travel across the map, as the two sides are split by this water going down the middle, and as soon as you crash into something with them, you'll pop up, and hopefully you landed safely. Sadly, the AI never bothers with using these, 
But doing this with players online and having these wild ship battles, watching people crash into walls and just explode, miss the jumps and perish into the waters, it's beautiful. These are the kind of maps I love. I can say a map is good, but it's maps like these that I can really talk about because they have something interesting that defines them. There's also bubbles in areas that you can ride up to, which is pretty boss. But not as boss as Bubble Bomb. Bumpy be best and best beep and Bubble Bomb. Gotta be one of my favorite weapons. It's basically an explosive with this wave-like shot pattern. Actually pretty nice at hitting the AI that just try to reaction dodge into it. Amazing map, from weapons to gameplay to aesthetics. It's all here. Okay, okay, what's next, what's next? Ugh, snap! You again? Copy Mega Man tells us that Wily wants to sleep in with the fishes. And yeah, the line with him switching through all the copy weapons. I'll give it up. That's pretty cool. Mega Man Big Deathmatch just has those dialogue moments and lines I won't forget. This is a very impressive fight, as copy Mega Man is on top of you with a myriad of attacks. From Yamamoto spam, Pharaoh shot spirit bombs, to hooking you and homing at you with the flame sword. Then he hits the centaur flash and turns invisible, and you won't like what happens next. Saving Grace is like with all encounters with Copy Mega, health does respawn. And we beat him. Hold up. He had all these weapons, and Maestro still won. Buster only. But little did Copy Mega know, the only Buster was him. He swears his revenge once more, and dips into some water. Alright, Gyroman's the whack stuff. I just don't know how I feel about maps this open with projectile weapons. In fact, quite a few of these weapons are close range, which I suppose is a good thing. You can speedrun do this one thanks to Electric Shock. Not gonna lie, I've been through many days and personality shifts throughout writing this script, so I'm not sure if I've told y'all how much I can't trust Jupiter players, but I still can't trust them. Mercury players too, but we'll get to that later. Neat aesthetic. Better than most deathmatch maps in other games, but I don't know. This one doesn't really do it for me. Maybe I'm just about the inside maps. You know, a wave of disgust really landed over me when I saw Gravity's Man's map. Mostly the AI's to blame for the weapons not being very good against them, though if I got my hands on Spark Chaser, things might have been a different story. This map gimmicks involve shifting gravity from none to heavy. It doesn't have that big of an impact as you may think, but then again, I don't really jump. And it's an interesting idea, it does change how you navigate at times. I would need to play this one against players more, but it's been a while since I've seen this one in rotations. I think Starman does the idea better, having outside areas with zero gravity and inside areas with normal gravity. This map has been changed from the version I'm used to, so I don't have a lot of thoughts on it, I was only here for like a minute. Big fan of the weapons. I know what you're thinking, Spacey, you one trick pony, if you bring up Drill Bomb and Air Shooter again, we're done here. And hey, I haven't said Air Shooter in at least 3 minutes. But we got Magic Card, a boomerang like weapon with no clip projectiles, how cool is that? Star Shield makes the comeback as the premier hugger experience, and Flash Bomby cooking too, with debatable usefulness in these zero G areas. Plug balls are pretty good on the inside too, having a ton of projectiles ground bouncing it all about. Napalm is here too, and it's pretty funny as Zero G. Definitely a very interestingly structured map with all the long jumps you can take thanks to the areas with no gravity. Crystal Man. Talk about a map I'm tired of seeing. But I see it a lot online for a reason. It's nice, small, balanced, simple. Really just two vertical arenas connected at the top, bottom, and middle by three hallways. Though the top and bottom rooms are spacious enough to lead to their own battles. Nice weapon selection too. Mega Man arm makes an appearance here, allowing Maestro to quite literally make someone catch their hands. We'll talk a little more about Mega Arm later. I have no complaints about this map. Good layout, good weapons, perfectly cromulent. I'm just a little bit worn out on it. I don't find it very interesting. But it's still a good map. I'm never sad going here, it's just alright. This is another map I end up playing all the time online. The difference from Crystal Man's and this map is that this one is actually pretty godlike. And that's not even talking about the music choice, which is already a bop. Large map with huge weapon variety and a lot of different ways to explore and navigate with it. Ladders, wind boosters, teleporters, all the works. 
absolutely jam-packed map with a little bit for everyone. Everyone's got their favorite rooms, everyone's got their routes they travel the map with. Darkman Castle isn't just a map, it's an experience and one of the best that Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch has to offer. Next up, we find ourselves walking around on the castle walls, where we suddenly get blasted, which is BS because Maestro still had their iframes from spawning in, which means whoever shot us is a f***ing hacker. We confront our attacker, who reveals themselves to be none other than... Proto Man. Mega Man's brother? They mistake us for Mega Man, which to be fair, from a distance, I don't blame him. He removes his disguise to reveal that he's actually Dark Man 4. Considering this game takes place a year after Mega Man 6, you gotta wonder why Wily's just repeating the same schemes. But who gives a dick? It's fan service. You may have noticed in the email receipt we looked at earlier with Light, yellow scars were a part of it, foreshadowing this. This fight allows us to use Proto Man's Buster, which has appeared in some maps beforehand, including the one we just played, as if secretly a tutorial to prepare us for this fight, while also being foreshadowing game design. Proto's weapon is a charge shot of extreme speed. When not charging, however, you have a shield that can be used to block bullets pretty consistently. Darkman 4 has an electric shield around him that causes a lot of shots to bounce off him, so shooting when he throws his shield is your best choice, and I don't think the shield can be blocked anyways considering it pierces through you. This is what we Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch players call a ripper. We injure Darkman 4, in awe of our power, they wonder who we are. And then, this happens. This game rules, man. Like, God, this game is awesome. Like, the line Proto Man has is godlike, too. This fight is hilarious, by the way. Let me break it down. Each Dark Man has their own attacks. The green tank, Dark Man 1, runs around and charges you for Bonko damage. Dark Man 2, the gray one, runs around with a shield with some attempt of hugging you. Dark Man 3, the purple sniper, jumps up and shoots at you, landing and shooting out these stunning rings. Darkman 4 jumps and shoots their shield. I like going for Darkman 3 first, as he doesn't have a shield and his obvious jumping pattern makes him look like the kids I schwack all the time online. b b b b b b Darkman 1 is pretty easy for the same reason. Take out 4, then 2, which is usually busy fighting Proto Man. They all drop large health orbs upon defeat, meaning this fight isn't too difficult once you manage to find the threat levels and determine an order. Love this ending shot me and Proto Man got together too. Proto tells us that this tournament was once again, total garbage. He doesn't know what Wily is planning, but he has a feeling we'll find out soon. He tells us we'll meet again, and oh man, yeah we'll meet again alright. Alright, let's head back to Light's lab. From the outside, we overhear the robot masters talking in celebration. We go in and find everyone crowding around a TV. Light tells us that Mega Man actually did end up finding Dr. Wily at some ramen shop. Wily's been handed over to the police and is now behind bars again. The news even has a recreation of what happened, so let's watch. Wily gets an interview, where he seems perfectly fine with being captive. Yeah, okay, how long do y'all want to bet until he breaks out? For some reason, Dr. Light thinks everything is okay now, like Wily doesn't always have some plan, and tells us to continue in the tournament. Like, dude, this game takes place a year after Mega Man 6, and that game ended with Wily being arrested, you know, for trying to take over the world? What happened? Did he escape? 
Did he just get released for good behavior? No rehabilitation or anything for the guy who tries to take over the world once every year? Meanwhile, Cossack, who didn't even do anything wrong, got his life screwed over there in Russia. And he only did what he had to because he was being blackmailed by Wiley. These people are hopeless. Hey, Maestro, when you're done with this tourney, we gotta get the hell out of here. It ain't safe here. This is like going to a large video game tournament, but then you find out it's in, f in Florida. Like you're putting your life on the line, but it is a major tournament, so you gotta go. Whatever, let's just finish this tournament off. Mega Man 6 rules. Tomahawk Man's map is a great one. A central area where most of the fighting takes place, two structures on each side, and a little cave off to the side as well. Very action heavy map that works pretty well with both small and large numbers. Silver Tomahawk is a powerful weapon that I enjoy using a lot. I'm pretty cool with a lot of the weapons here. Nice. Centaur Man's map is a one I see online a lot for some reason. It's pretty sizable and mixes in water and land areas pretty well. Quite a bit of areas to go to, some are a little less popular than others, and a teleporter to help mitigate the traveling. I'm not sure how I feel about all the climbing, whether it be stairs, pillars, or ladders. Mixed out with the water, and I don't know, this is just is a weird map for me. It doesn't really feel like there's any one area where people gather to fight, and maybe that's a good thing, but I don't know. Sometimes I'd be playing this map, and it just reminds me of how lonely I am. Like, where is everyone? Did I enter an empty server on accident? It does have Bubble Bomb though, which definitely adds points in my book. Wait, I just tabbed back into my footage. It's got Napalm Bomb too? Hold up. Nightman. Amazing map. Absolute classic. Sadly, Team Last Man Standing is the common for nowadays online and people just camp their minds off here. But the good thing about Deathmatch is that camping usually doesn't work. I'm really just a big fan of the castle layout. And there's huge weapon variety here too, seeing everyone show up in battles with their own weapons they found owns. Every room has several exits that branch off to other areas of the map. It feels spacious but when you can go basically anywhere from any room it really works. Even if I may be slightly scarred from that time I played a CBM duel match here and got perfected. To be fair it was Dr. Light vs Tornado Man so that would have been bad anywhere. Oh hey a hidden challenger, I wonder who this could be. Yep. It's the last killer, it's Ballade Man baby. And after knowing from Punk that I only have one chance of doing this, I tried really hard. Like I was stressing out near the end because I actually really like Ballade Man's Ballade Cracker. Ballade Man hops around three times, dropping the Ballade Trackers before rushing you and then throwing a cracker directly at you. He loops this until halfway through, where he transforms to become cooler. He doesn't really do anything different in this form besides dropping an extra bomb on his hops, but he just got a lot faster and losing sight of him will likely end at a GG. But for my love of Ballade Cracker, I needed to take the dub. Pharaoh Shot works really well for this fight and it's nice being able to use it on AI that doesn't completely try to avoid you. Also I don't know who did the music for this fight, but talk about an upgrade from the original song. Ballade Cracker is a pretty simple throwable bomb with splash damage. It's pretty strong. And the only thing that kind of bloats about it, besides the fact that it blows up, ha he who, is the fact that it doesn't hold a lot of max ammo. Oh my god, I love Blizzard, man. Oh yeah, and the stage is cool too. Shouts to any Blizzard bowlers out there coming through with the Blizzard bonks. This is a pretty interesting small map based around the floating ship in the middle. There's teleporters to get to either side of it. Journeying across ice platforms or the ship can be pretty dangerous if you're terrible at video games. I mostly just use Ballet Cracker, but there's a bit of weapons here I don't get to use too often that I enjoy also. I like this map, a lot of freedom when it comes to traveling around, like if you don't feel like fighting between the islands you can just take the teleporter to close in on people, or try to flank from the caves where you may find people in as well. Even if the boat is kind of a terrible place to be, as you get blasted from all sides, it's still a pretty neat set piece that sets this map apart from the others. Plant Man's my homie, I'm not gonna front but I never really cared for this map. There's just a lot of far off structures and walls to hide behind. I feel like a lot of the time I can't see my enemies before they just pop out from somewhere and blast me. 
a lot of the ground is covered in water and I don't know, it just makes you, it feel sluggish. I don't know. This map just doesn't feel good to exist in. There's a lot of attempts to mega manify this level up, such as these platforms you shoot to jump on alongside springs. But I don't know, maybe there's something valuable, but I never see anyone going out of their way to do these shoot platforms. And something about these springs just give me bad vibes in general. But whatever, skill issue, am I right? Flame Man is a very closed in, complex level. Like even now I don't entirely understand the layout. There's some pretty cute stuff though, like placing E-Tanks near oil pits, making it kind of risky going there if someone's sitting around the place ready to do a little trolling. I don't dislike the map, but I never particularly look forward to going here. Windman. I don't mind this map, it has treble boost, which is pretty cool. Only time I'll be using it in the campaign. Treble Sentry too, just a treble kind of map, you know? Has a very pleasant aesthetic and layout. Very CTF layout too, with the two opposing sides and the battles taking place in the middle area. I need to play more deathmatch on this map because as you may imagine from the layout, it can be kind of a camp fest in other modes. There's also some elevators on the side that I always found kind of weird, but they probably lead to something powerful. Yamamoto Man's map is pretty cool, kind of cluttered with all the different terrains, water, conveyor belts, elevations. It's definitely a map more about the one-off encounters you have with other players in these different rooms and navigating around with a multitude of ways. Not every deathmatch map needs to have an open area where everyone gathers to randomly blast each other from all angles. I think this map is a good example of that. And running around maps like these with Slash Claw, that's always a good time. Yamamoto Man's Spear is a fun weapon on in itself. There's some fun to be had with rapid fire weapons, and why Spear is one of my favorites. Well, that's all the Robot Masters, so it's time we once again go to the penultimate level for this chapter. And... <laughs> Mr. X Fortress. Oh, man. If this wasn't deathmatch, I was ready to grand slam this map into the ground. This is a troll camp map on any other mode than deathmatch, so you end up seeing it voted for a lot. But on deathmatch, the mode this was made for, this map rules. The layout is just amazing. Large maps with tons of way to travel, from teleporters to boost pads. Jumping the people trying to snipe you with homing sniper is that magic. The fight outside the main structure on these smaller buildings are great too. This map is just full of a mix of open arenas to battle it out in, alongside a lot of tighter areas for more closed in battles. The extremes between the hallway fights and the shooting people between the buildings really encourages the player to switch to appropriate weapons in order to stay in action at all times. This is like THE map for large player counts. There's just so much to it. I love maps like these, but if every map was like this, it would be tiring. And that's what's great about playing through all these maps back to back. They all have things that make them stand out. They don't all have to play the same. Not just from the weapons, but from the layouts and how players are encouraged to move around the map. Okay, are you ready for the finale of this part? Maestro wins, being labeled as the champion. We're taken to the inside of the building as a celebration plays out, with plans for Maestro to be on the news. It's just a chill spot to go around and talk to people. Hey, who's this guy? Oh hey, you can find the Mega Man killer sulking it up in the bar. Look at these sad boys. Punk would probably be here too if he didn't clap me earlier. Also, for some reason, the structure of the beginning of this map is just Doom E1 M1 hangar, which is kind of awesome, albeit random. Like, yeah, I see you. Dr. Light congratulates us and we're taken inside to the ceremony. Everyone is here to celebrate Maestro. Yeah, yeah, praise them, dap them up. They deserve it all. Y'all couldn't even touch them. Mr. X comments on this tourney being proof that if the world is ever faced with evil, it can be defended thanks to these powerful robots. Without realizing that if the world was ever in danger, it will probably be because of these powerful robots. All I'm saying is that if Maestro ever turns evil, that's a GG for this world. I'll catch y'all in the next one. Celebrations are cut short, however, as the lights turn off. Everyone but the player is in confusion on what could possibly be happening. Free from jail, Wily shows up on the monitor. Mr. X uselessly runs away as Wily begins to put his plan into motion. Mega Man ends up getting snatched up by Gutsman and held hostage. 
Why the reveal is that he actually altered Gutsman's code after capturing him, which is why during our escape the door opened. Gutsman being saved was all part of the plan. Wily says that if they don't let themselves be reprogrammed to join his army, he'll have Mega Man killed. And honestly? I mean, if he's just going to reprogram Mega Man after reprogramming everyone else here, then you might as well let Mega Man die? Like, I'm pretty sure that's what he's gonna do. What, whatever. So everyone starts converting as Wily says he'll be over there shortly. In the machine both him and Light worked on together long ago. Gamma, which he had previously obtained the plans for once more. With everyone else being converted, all that's left is Maestro. And seeing how they just got crowned as the strongest robot warrior, this is definitely red alert for the world right now. Somebody needs to do something. Light is f***ing useless, but luckily Mega Man comes through with his super arm and destroys the machine. This leads basically Mega Man and Maestro being the only ones around not converted to join Wily's army and Mega Man is in no condition to fight. Dr. Light concludes that they need to retreat and come up with a plan, but Maestro? Maestro says nah. They're ready to take on an entire robot army all by themselves, and even Wily, who plans on showing up with Gamma. Light is stunned, but Mega Man believes in us. They've already technically beaten everyone anyways, right? They wish us good luck as they retreat, leaving just Maestro alone. Alright baby, here we go. Before being able to even leave the celebration area, we're attacked by all the Mega Man 1 robot masters, obtaining their weapons after defeating them. We beat them as Maestro moves on, area after area fighting every robot master thus far as they climb their way to the top of the fortress, all while this awesome remix as the Mega Man final boss theme plays. Each Robot Master uses their own weapons as well, it's so cool. The first arena we fight the Mega Man 1 robots in is the Celebration Hall where it all started. Bomb Man's bombs can possibly one shot you, and Oil Man can really rush you down. While these fights are mostly against the bot AI we're used to fighting, I think they've actually been upgraded a little bit. I'll go into this later, but they're, but they're better at navigating and even add a jump to their arsenal now. But that also means you can bait out their jumps and punish them, which is how you're going to be winning a lot of these encounters. We arrive in the garden to take on the Mega Man 2 bosses. Metal Man can be a huge problem with its hard to dodge metal blades. I'm not entirely sure if this boss fight incorporates weaknesses or not, it probably doesn't. But just stick to what you're good with. You'll be switching weapons a lot due to the lack of ammo anyways. All of these Mega Man 2 fights can be pretty scary with how they rush you down. Air Man is funny because he doesn't use his weapon correctly and you're basically safe if you don't jump. Crash Man also spawns in a pretty funny spot. You're not going to get enough weapon energy in between fights to refill everything, so ideally you want to choose the weapons that are good against the AI and hold a lot of max ammo in order to use it to the fullest. In other words, maybe don't refill Ballet Cracker, not yet at least. The Mega Man 3 robots are fought in this tiny statue room. This makes some robots like Gemini Man pretty scary due to the ricocheting shots. Like I don't think you understand just how fast you can get destroyed in this fight. Some robot masters also appear on the roofs of the nearby buildings outside to try and shoot you. Cossacks and Mega Man 4 bosses are fought in the aquarium area. Trying to find the appropriate weapons to snipe these guys can be hard, especially if you aren't knowledgeable on how weapon inventory is sorted with the hotkeys, because this is when you're going to find yourself swapping weapons more often than actually fighting. Drill Man breaks the aquarium part of the arena halfway through, opening and flooding the area up. Dive Man's super homing missiles can be trouble, and you don't want Toad Man getting close to you. The Mega Man 5 bosses are fun in this circular area with changing gravity, replicating that gimmick from the Gravity Man stage. Depending on the current gravity situation, some encounters can be tougher than others. Whatever you do, do not jump against Gravity Man. We platform our way to the final set of Robot Masters, and honestly, this one gave me the most trouble. Flame Man is a pain. Wind Man is just as terrible as fighting him in CBM, you get juggled by this guy. And honestly, at this point, I was getting pretty frustrated switching through all these weapons. That's the only thing I hold against this fight, having to deal with your inventory. But with enough patience and pain, we make it through. Maestro really just beat 48 Robot Masters in a row. God, they're cool. We aren't done yet though. 
As in the hallway afterwards, we encounter an old friend. It's Copy Mega Man, and they're here to take us out and be number one. Well, here we go. Let's do this. Okay, okay, okay. This fight is a lot. First of all, every step Gamma takes will hurt you. I don't know why, but Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch bosses love this mechanic, so you have to jump with his steps. But the problem with that is that Gamma's weakness is on his forehead, so you're not going to be able to see his legs. You just gotta learn the rhythm. Gamma has a lot of attacks that encourage you to look back down at the ground actually, such as these lasers with a trail and this flame path cage, but I'm stubborn and I tried to brute force it anyways. Ballet Cracker isn't bad on this boss, but I found Crash Bomb to be incredible. Upon losing all HP, Gamma kneels down as Wily summons enemies before repairing Gamma. This happens a few times, and some of his minions can straight up chop you. After the healing for about the third or fourth time, he rises again as you hear a faint whistle in the background. Hell yeah, it's Proto Man with the clutch. He hands us a super claw shot and tells us that Gamma's weakness is a powerful, close ranged weapon. Luckily, I played Mega Man 3, and if you did too, then you know what time it is, baby. You know it. It's top spin time. Gamma is defeated, and the world is saved. Wily begs for mercy, and as Maestro approaches them... Bro, are you serious? Damn! Man, this Edgelord's ruining everything. Travel takes Wily away as Base comes and starts roasting us. Like, god dang, do you know what Maestro just went through? Give them a break! Base says he's not interested in fighting Maestro until they're at full strength, promising a real fight soon. He screws off. I guess kinda just assumes Maestro isn't going to die here. Luckily they don't, as Mr. X, finally doing something god dang useful, sends out some rescue robots and finds Maestro, sending them to Light Slab to be repaired. Maestro ends up getting a statue built after them, lasting long enough that even X sees it, which feels like a pretty random cut. Mega Man X sucks. Don't take me too seriously. <laughs> this cut does actually make sense when you consider that this was actually to cap off the ending of the first version of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. And while it's definitely been updated over the years, what a great start to the campaign. I really am surprised how good of a story can be told from an arena shooter. But I think all the story beats and pacing works out here. And even with Mega Man's large cast, I feel like a lot of characters have their moments. I mean, they're all technically the final boss, right? Like seriously, that final part of climbing up and beating everyone was so cool. With the way everything is built to the Gamma fight, alongside all the fan service of doing these fights but in first of person shooter, and just having some cool as hell moments beforehand, I thought this was like, the peak. Like the rest would just be small bonus chapters. But well, 
Little did I know just how wrong I was. Who's next? Who's next? You? Come on, don't even try to swing at me, because you're done. So I wanted to do an intermission here, you know, just chill out for a bit, but I wasn't entirely sure what to do. My hands are kind of full, and I don't want to do anything that would take up too much time, so cancel the idea of a tier list. And I know y'all are waiting for that one Robot Master tier list I promised oh so long ago. Someday, baby. Someday. So besides these jokes, I didn't really feel like coming up with anything. Like, do you see the length of this video? It's already long as hell. But much like with the official Mega Man games, I'm gonna put it in your hands not to burn yourself out by marathoning this video. Now would be a good time to take a nice break. I got the YouTube chapters laid out so you know when to come back to, you know? Though, I know some of y'all are just ready to jump back in. So, let's see what's going on at Light Slab. Dr. Light repairs Maestro and tells them that Wily is back at it again and now he's attacking different parts of the world. Mega Man is already running out there to clap him as per usual, but Light believes that we need to go too, just in case. Way to have faith in your boy, Light. Like seriously? We're already doing this again? Maestro just got repaired, and now they gotta fight again? How does Mega Man deal with this? Give Maestro a break! That's it. We need filler. Yeah, you heard me. I request a beach episode on the double. Maybe Wily would like challenge Light to a volleyball contest or something and Light would be like, I round up the boys. And there'd be like a huge throwdown. Maybe you play his role, but it's like old school class based modifications role where her room would just reflect every projectile in the game so she would just win by default. All I'm saying is that I have the airman design ready. Or how about a holiday episode? Just imagine, Wily tries to take over Christmas. So I guess if you take over the world, you kind of take over the holidays too by default, huh? But maybe that's not enough to take the Christmas spirit, you know? Maybe Wily should start his own religion, just get holidays from that. I feel like at some point I was supposed to connect the fact that Dr. Light would have been Santa Claus. Maybe on Christmas, he dresses up as Santa and just goes around giving all Wily, Cossack, and all the Robot Masters gifts. Yeah, add that to the canon. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Dang, I thought I skipped the intermission. Why is it still talking nonsense? And, uh, don't worry, baby. Let's focus up. I'm here. I'm here. Light also shows us our trophy that we got from winning the tournament, which has been stored in this room. And you know, Light... I see your karate gi right there, so I don't know why you just don't walk up to Wily and... <laughs> Anyways, we got a message from the bad box art Mega Man, they actually do seem like a pretty cool person. We really do gotta hang out later. I'll call you later though, we got a world to save. <laughs> Freeze! Man. Freeze, man. I like how this level starts with a cutscene of Robot Masters watching Maestro. Now being known for beating Gamma and winning the tournament, everyone wants to beat them up to prove that they're the strongest. Even though we aren't in a tournament anymore, the rules are still the same. Score enough points to move on. I always like Frostman's map. Might be a weapon bias thing because I enjoy the weapons here, but there's a small drill to the ice sliding to get around. Don't listen to Napalm, man. He doesn't know the fun of putting the hands on people. It's a map I end up seeing pretty often. I don't think there's anything overly noteworthy about it, but I enjoy it. Junk Man. You know, I always love Junk Man's theme. Not a map I've played in Deathmatch before, and I mostly just hung out on one side of the map, so I don't know what weapons are on the other side. Magma Bazooka still isn't good yet. I'll explain that later. So I basically just relied on Eddie for the hookups. You may have noticed by now, but yeah, you can freeze the lava to create new pathways to travel around. It's actually pretty useful for getting around to one side of the map to the other. Just be aware of how freezing things work or you'll... I'm not sure if I entirely enjoy this level, I need to play some more deathmatch on it. You know, despite all the weird crap, 
First man's level is pretty alright. There's bouncy bubble pads, purple water that makes you rise, and exploding platforms, but it works. A map of pretty long hallways and a lot of places to get into fights. Also, you know we boppin' with the bubble bomb on the double. Oh, hold up, this map rules. Cloudman's map is that wild kind of map I love. A lot of areas to run around to and a lot of different places to be on encounters. I love the middle section with the two areas high up where you can shoot down on people. I actually did some plays with the ice wall here. You have to put it down and push it, but just that it sitting there has a hitbox and the AI falls for that. I love the aesthetic overall with the outside area. I don't know what causes it, but it can actually rain outside where there will be a wind effect blowing players, which for what it's worth makes going outside such a bad option that it changes people's routes of the maps. And I don't know, I wish more maps did that, I think that's neat. Perfectly sized, has some cool arenas to fight in, and a teleporter on each side to keep the action active. Great map. Springman's map is an example of why I love the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch campaign maps. They aren't afraid to make any sacrifices for a gimmick. What I'm trying to say is that you need to get to the spring zone, coward. Backhands only. There's still some places to have some normal fights go down, but even the AI knows where the real action's at. I also always thought that some of the spring platforming was pretty cool. And the fact that it's required and valuable enough that most players submit to the gimmick and do it to travel around is a mark of good map design. Screw y'all, this map rules. Slashman, pause. Banger rendition of Slashman's theme, I love it. Unpause. Okay, so this map's got a visual overhaul since I last played it, and here's a screen of an older version of it from one of my crappy montage videos. And here's the same area now. It looks a lot better. There's some pretty cool parts of this map I enjoy going to, like the forest area and some enjoyable larger rooms for the encounters as well. And travel is aided by writing these currents and hopping off at different rooms that you want to be in. It's pretty well crafted. Unfortunately, it's probably the worst map I encountered when it comes to the AI, who constantly got stuck against this wall on the current. AI have pit protect on always, meaning they can't self destruct by falling into spikes and such. So I basically just sat there and farmed until I won. Which kind of makes my footage not very well suited towards showing off the map. Sometimes I forget I'm recording for a video. I like the map, but I need to play deathmatch with non AI to get a better view of how it all works. I honestly wouldn't have much to say if it wasn't for past experiences, just due to how the AI acted. Shademan's map is another great one, very interesting design when it comes to the arenas, and there's some pretty fun rooms. I know one of these maps I have footage of it, but Noise Crusher translates in such a cool way to for a first person shooter, being able to run, fire it at a wall, and get the Noise Crusher charged as it bounces back into you. I'll be sure to bring that up on the map I actually use it on if it hasn't happened yet. I kind of sat around this one area here because you see these bats flying through? Well, rarely, one of the bats will be a red armor from Ghosts and Goblins, and shooting it will play the Ghouls and Ghosts Stage 1 theme, which is of course a reference to the actual Mega Man series having an easter egg when entering Shadesman's stage. It's almost like this game was made by people who really like Mega Man. As you can tell from this footage, that kinda sorta just never happened. That's a shame, but to be fair, this rendition of Shademan's theme rules. And honestly, Shademan's theme has always been better than the Super Ghouls and Ghosts theme. I think we can just keep it this way. Turbo Man is kinda degen, but I like the aesthetic. There's these turbo riders that are racing around in circles, and it's basically guaranteed that they'll score a frag on someone. Even getting hit by one of them pops you up, basically stunning you to get slammed by someone else. Decent layout. I'm not sure how I feel about all the climbing though, because putting your back to everyone to slowly climb a ladder or platform on some boxes is kind of like typing in kill in the console. I don't have much to say, it's a pretty silly map I see online surprisingly often. Alright, that's everyone. So now it's time for Skull Fortress. Another banger of a map. This is also where my noise crusher footage comes in. Just a solid map overall. And I enjoy the ways that you can travel from the exterior or travel through the interior. Listen, 
I'm trying my best to give reviews on these maps, but at some point you gotta realize that I am saying the same things over and over. Jumping on the Mega Ball to get the treble sentry is a pretty good play, and those birds on the outside can actually be shot where they will immediately shoot back at you, meaning that hiding behind them in an encounter is actually somewhat viable. You can also team kill with it which is pretty funny. Okay, here we go. After finishing Skull Fortress, we encountered none other than... Bass. Or is it Bass? Why do I call him Bass? Bass. His theme rules in this. But anyways, this fight... Oh man. Like, I know Cutman Mike made Ghoul's Forest, but the jump scares in here are too much. Like, I think this might be scarier than Ghoul's. Basically, Bass... Basically, Bass will... Can I just fucking call him Forte? Basically, Bass will start charging, and when you hear that charging sound, your blood runs cold. Because he'll either go for a charge shot, or dash at you and crescent kick you. And I tell you, trying to dodge the crescent kick at first is a nightmare, because he will rush you down until he releases it. No wall will stop him. Like, look at this. This was like a scripted event from a horror game. <laughs> Crescent Kick can shop you too, which is something I always liked about the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch boss fights. All it takes is one hit and you lose so much. Other than that, he'll jump and shoot at you and has that spread fire attack. Sadly, his buster is a lot better than yours, so trading with him won't work. Take cover and fire when he's vulnerable. Strafing diagonally away from base seems to be the way to dodge his Crescent Kick. Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch bosses always seem so difficult at first, but it's all about finding the answers and executing it. This phase actually took me a bit, like 9 to 10 minutes. And yeah, I said phase. After lowering his health enough, he admits he wasn't fighting at full power before dropping in treble. And uh, yeah, hell not to that. This is a 1v2 now. You're cheating! This is no longer a fair fight. He tries to justify this by saying him and Treble are, are inseparable, but I think he's just a loser. He destroys the ground with his power, and the second phase begins. The items we couldn't get on the pillage from earlier drop down, including the power adapter, which is pretty cool, an adapter versus an adapter battle. Like has the Mega Man series ever capitalized on that? Rock and Rush versus Forte and Treble, like come on, that's pretty cool. You can charge the power adapter for a homing fist, but the homing kind of sucks. You're only going to be hitting base for the most part when he stops moving. I beat this phase first try, because it's actually pretty easy. You just have to make sure you aren't running with base on top of you, and be ready to dodge some of his attacks. Although I do admit his meteor attack is pretty hard to dodge. Base admits defeat, and tells us to leave. As Wily knows we're here, and this place will probably blow up any minute. You can chill with base if you want, but there's nowhere to go but home. So, let's get out of here. As Maestro walks away from the Skull Fortress- Okay, okay. Should I do this now? Fine. So, there's hidden bosses in this campaign. In fact, I already, already fought three of them, the Mega Man Killers. They all have requirements to fight them. I'm planning on going into them later, but there is one here, so... And I think we should talk about it, okay? How do you access this one? Well, you have to defeat the second form of base without the power adapter. And I'm gonna be honest, just using your buster is a lot easier than using the power adapter. Same strategy overall, just hit him when he pauses. I don't know if you're allowed to grab the power adapter at all, so trying to dodge it might be a challenge too. Anyways, you may be wondering just who this hidden boss could be. Well. If you played Mega Man 7, I think you already know. Now when we attempt to exit the Skull Fortress, someone stops us. And we turn around to see none other than- Aw oh, snap! It's Wily Capsule. And there's no E-Tank spam to save us this time. This fight isn't overly difficult, but it's the kind of fight where you can just get your whole health bar melted immediately. All Wily does is teleport around, shoot out elemental balls, and then drops a 4-way cardinal spread electric ball bopper. But he basically does this all at the same time. 
You copy weapons are in the form of Thunderbolt and Wild Coil. I think Wild Coil is just there for the reference of that being his weakness in Mega Man 7, because there is no way in hell you're actually going to hit him with that, so it's a troll. Thunderbolt works well though. My strategy was to get hit by the Ice Elemental Balls, as they don't do a lot of damage and they make you invincible. Like you can dodge them, but then the Electrical Balls will probably schwack you. As you might imagine, the problem with this silly strategy is that if Wily doesn't shoot an Ice Ball out, you will die. But he doesn't have a lot of health, it's a quick fight. We defeat him, only to find out he was just a fake. Thanks for wasting everyone's time man, I hope Mega Man is blasting you as we speak. I like to think Maestro just went on this journey just because they wanted to get revenge on base rather than actually trying to stop the doctor. Like alright, they're satisfied now. As they walk away from the Skull Fortress, it erupts in flames, which is pretty awesome. Like, dang Maestro, so cool. I always imagine that the robots that build these places for Wily must get so pissed at how expendable Wily makes these things. Like dang, we just spent months on crunch on this and you just hit the self-destruct button? Come on man. Anyways, that's the end of version 2. Yeah, chapters are basically just going to be full versions from here on out. So, you might be thinking, with how we just finished Mega Man 7, does that mean... Yep. Get ready! Because he's coming. But also just... No, just the existence of Big Puyo. No. Back at Light's Lab, we get some junk mail from Junk Man trying to get our credit cards. Dr. Light congratulates us on basically accomplishing nothing. Meanwhile, Mega Man is still going across the entire world trying to find Wily. The conversation gets interrupted with shaking and a window shattering flash. Everyone gathers around to see a robot that has crashed into the ground. Seeing as he is not an enemy, we take him back to the lab. Mega Man shows up as well to discuss this robot. He's been damaged to the point of needing a new body, and nobody knows who their creator is. He has coordinates on a tracking device, as if he was looking for someone. Light entrusts us to find out just who this robot he was looking for is. Meanwhile, trusting Mega Man to protect the lab in case this robot's intentions are unpure. Well, y'all have fun with that. Let's see what's up. <laughs> Mega Man 8 rules. I've never played Mega Man 8 before. <laughs> Tengu Man. This map has a pretty interesting thing. There's two different music tracks that can play here, referencing how the Saturn versions and PlayStation versions of Mega Man 8 had some different songs at certain stages. You actually set a preference for this in the options menu. I, of course, chose the Saturn version because I have good taste. They're both good songs in their own way, to be fair. But I just got a thing for the brass. It's why I love Duo's theme, too. But of course, the song has been reditionalized into chiptune, making it even more banger slapper. Good job, Orange Mario. All we cherish that time we cheated the hell off in Death Run. What a day. This Frostman line is godlike, by the way. Pretty long map, all things considered, with some enjoyable weapons throughout. It's about time I get to use Pirate Mine again. Homing Sniper is pretty neat, when it works. Yeah, I'd rather just rely on my own aim, when that works. I see Astro Crush up on the pillar, but I'm not sure how to get it. Maybe you need to roll for an item from the party ball. Tengu Blade is pretty neat. I guess you can use it for attacking, but it's not terrible as a movement option either. This map is pretty symmetrical. There isn't much difference between the two different sides. There's a little platforming area off to the sides that I'm not sure why anyone would go to, but maybe it's good for homing sniper camping. I think this map is pretty popular. I see it pretty often and I'm pretty chill with it. I've come here, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> Why does he say that? <laughs> Anyways, this map is interesting. A lot of places to be higher up on and shoot down on others. 
This area out here seems to get a lot of attention. A lot of areas end up just being weird corners you end up to after falling down a pit teleporter. Astral Crush isn't here. If you remember, Astral Man has two different copy weapons, and we got Copy Vision here. I never really bothered with it, though it's probably good against the AI. But it does what you think. You create a copy of yourself that shoots, and you can change where that copy shoots with M1. It's pretty cool, but I'll stick to my Rebound Striker and Dust Crushers. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the teleporters, there's a lot of ways to move around the map, and people end up coming in from all directions. Which even so, this map isn't particularly large either, so unless if I'm trying to go to a special spot, I usually just run around. Swordman's map is weird. You can only get Flame Sword by taking a teleporter on the other side of the map, otherwise it's just on an unreachable platform. The map is pretty open, which would probably lead towards fights at long ranges, which isn't something Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch is particularly known for, or Doom in general I suppose. When two people with super shotguns see each other in a distance, they both just run to find the nearest way to confront them. Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch doesn't have any hit scans. In fact, a lot of the projectiles are pretty slow, which kind of makes me avoid the more open areas on this map. It's just not very fun to fight in open areas, and it's not a great look for Flame Sword either. Unless if you're hiding around corners, people are going to see you coming. All this kind of just makes this map feel weird to me. I mean, there's a couple more close ranged weapons, but the laser trident is right there, and that's an extremely fast projectile. I don't think it's a bad map. I don't think any of these maps really are. I just don't really vibe with it. It's too good for me, you know? Sad Spacey, Chad Swordsman map. Clown Man's map is... Yeah, I like it. There's some funny stuff. There's a train that goes by. Appearing in these places on the map, it's very rare you see anyone actually get hit by the train. They're quite infrequent and out of the way, which arguably makes it funnier when it does happen. There's these circle cross platforms, which I'm not sure if they function as I see them do on other maps using the same blocks, but the circle ones can heal you, which is interesting. You can get Thunderclaw to swing from these hooks. I mean, I assume you can. I didn't get any footage of that, but you probably can. Hey, maybe y'all should just watch someone else. I'm no good. I'm, I'm crumb. That's me, Spacey Crummy. This map is automatically good thanks to Magma Bazooka. The AI still isn't at the point where you're using it as fully viable, but I'm still a Firebender Maestro player, so I can still crisp it up from time to time. But I mostly cooked with Pirate Mine. I'm honestly surprised how much I like this copy weapon. I never really used it much before. Maybe it's just good on AI. I've seen Chill Wave quite a few times, and while I like the weapon, I feel like it just doesn't work well against the AI. But I don't know, maybe it does. There's a few weapons I like, but probably won't talk about due to the AI dodging it. Eddie's also on this map if you need him. You just need a swing with the Electric Claw, so I guess you can. This map is a little silly, and can be overwhelming with the... Uh, everything going on, but I think it's fine. Searchman's map is the first time I actually had to mute the music, which is sort of just a thing with me and Chiptune. My ears are very sensitive, and sometimes there's songs that just break past my barriers. Neat map. Got the ground floor with the grass that you can hide behind, which doesn't really work well with the AI, who I think can see you behind the grass anyways. So I usually just stick to the above areas for better clarity. Air shooter and napalm bomb I hear, well that can be rough on the top path because areas are pretty open and homing sniper is pretty out in the open. So maybe staying under to dodge the homing fire and navigating that way is the best. I always like this area here alongside this stair room. Jump, jump! It's Frostman. Say it with me everybody. This map rules. Great weapons, music, aesthetics. The things they are used to hearing, but traveling around the outside of the map on the snowboards is awesome. Like teleport is to get around the map? Sleep. Battling it out on the snowboards with other players? That's my stuff. Sadly the AI isn't about the snowboard life, so we're cruising solo today. Grenade Man's map is pretty simple, compact, split into several open arena rooms to fight in. You can say maps like these aren't the most interesting, you could say it's just a bunch of arenas stitched together, but I like these kinds of maps. And there is something added by the explosion platforms in the middle section allowing some cross through between the arenas. Plus this is like the only map where they give you slash claw and the hook shot. I'm living my dream out here. 
Flash Bomb is also a pretty cool weapon. Wow. Mega Man 8 really did just have the best music, huh? Well, there goes all the Mega Man fans. I don't know how much the community messes with water maps, but out of all the official campaign maps, this is probably my favorite. I never see this map played anymore, so I definitely can't say too much on it. It's just very pleasant to look at. And yeah, the aesthetics are winning me over. Dare I say it's even as handsome as Aquaman. Trust me, this part of the script was going to be full of Mega Man 8 dub references, but I resisted. This map is cool. I want to play on it more. And maybe the cool thing about Deathmatch as a game mode is that you just get to see more maps. All these years of playing Team Last Man Standing has led to some of the, like, the most boring standardized maps. And I think the cool thing about Deathmatch servers is that you can play on maps like these. After Aquaman, we get a cutscene of Mega Man getting slapped by the newly restored robot. Like, yeah, good job, Mega Man. You had one job. We go back to the lab where Light tells us all of this, giving us the task of hunting down the escaped robot while Mega Man gets repaired. Side note, but I like the idea of Roll still calling Mega Man Rock. Like, Loreheads, you gotta help me out on this one, but I don't know. He was like Rock before being turned into a fighting robot, where he was then Mega Man? Like, yeah, okay, he's Rockman in the Japanese version because some clueless American thought Rockman was a lame name. Silly. Were you telling me before Mega Man was a fighting robot, his name was just Mega? You got me messed up. What kind of name is Mega? Though to be honest, if anyone's watching here, his name is Mega. That's actually pretty rad. Alright, let's finish off Mega Man 8. Okay. Okay, so Duo's map is a map for the gamers, you know? Absolute classic. It brings a tear to my eye, really. If there was a school teaching kids about FPS map design, I feel like this map would be the first lesson. There is not a single square of map here that I do not like. From the central areas, the side beach areas, there's just so many places to have some good encounters. I don't even really mess with any of the weapons here and I still enjoy it. Duo's weapons here, alongside being in Grenade's map, has a neat bit of foreshadowing. But yeah, I love this map, and I think others do too. I've been call voted into this one quite a number of times. I just like maps like these, with a ton of areas all connected in neat ways. Tons of entrances to every room. It's just the right kind of map for me. I wish I was better explaining these things. After beating this map, we want run into, well, it's Duo. Y'all know who this is by this point, right? He tells us he needs to stop the evil energy, and instead of doing anything civil, he just starts fighting us. Duo's kinda weird, but he's a homie. God, what a banger, a bolly bopper of a track. This fight sucks, by the way. Okay, that was rude. This might be my second least favorite boss fight in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. You got the arrow buster here as your weapon, which you can basically just think of as a charge shot. Duo's got these ground pounds that can instantly kill you, not even kidding. Which actually gets pretty tough to avoid as the fight goes on. Don't get yourself cornered. Like, I don't blame Mega Man for getting clapped in that small as hell hallway against Duo. I wouldn't have survived that either. Well, I mean, Maestro, I mean, if, if Duo did that crap to me in real life, yeah, I'll catch y'all in the next one. He also has the Cyberman 3 missile attack, but because Duo is one of the coolest Mega Man characters, he's quite literally throwing his hands at you. I think this attack is funny, because even if it's the classic strafe this 3 shoot attack, Mega Man even deathmatch bosses are so good, that this attack is sort of just a joke. I almost didn't even mention it, it just shows how far we've come. Like compared to stuff like that, Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch is just a cut above. A cut man mic above. Anyways, if it's not clear, I don't like this fight because Duo just spends the entire fight in pinball mode. Like, it's the definition of just sitting around waiting for the boss to expose their weak point. I don't think he's invincible during Duo Meter, but I'm not gonna waste my charge shot trying to hit this. It feels really random too. I never got hit by it, but if I did, I'd probably just call it unfair luck damage anyways. It's like every few seconds the game pauses and you just have to sit around and wait for the fight to continue. Like yeah, I'm sure Duo's having a blast right now, I mean that looks fun, good for him, but I'm standing here watching him pop off for half the fight. 
Sure, I was getting burned out a bit by this point, running through 10 years of content in like, a week, but in comparison of quality to the other fights, this one doesn't sit well with me. But it is fast at least. We beat him and he teleports off, with us following him to the Skull Tower. I don't have any strong opinions on this map. It's the kind of map where I explore it like an AI with unfinished pathing. Like there's just a section on the side I rarely if ever go to. I only did it this time because I wanted to see if there was anything in the cubby. The area with two opposing stairs has always led to some fun fights. And everything on the lowest floor is pretty good too. Very odd weapon selection, but I guess it's nice to have maps that even if they don't have my favorite weapons, they still have weapons I don't find myself using often, and it's interesting in its own right. But I mean, I play Doom multiplayer, and that mostly consists of running around the map with the same 2-4 to four weapons. I guess I can ultimately lean pretty positive on this map. Nearly all the Mega Man 8 maps are maps I see pretty regularly, so that may speak for something. Definitely some of the more memorable maps to me. Skull Tower Interior is yet another one of these maps. It's a good map. I've played on here quite a few times. Okay, what do you want me to say, you know? I don't know how many maps I've reviewed so far, but there's only so many ways I can word it. It's just a solid map. No gimmick or anything that I can really focus on. Maybe that doesn't make the map very interesting, but it's maps like these that get played often for that reason. You want me to get creative? Fine. This is a nice Pokeball map. Yeah, you like that? Being able to travel freely alongside the edges fully, with battles taking place in the red and white halves, even a bit in the middle to cross between the two sides. You might think it's time to catch them all, but the only things you'll be catching are my hands. Quite literally, because Duo's weapons here. After winning, the game immediately cuts to the ceiling breaking, which caught me off guard. Descending from the hole is the evil robot. I think he's called Trio in the comics. All the Mega Man 8 robot masters we just fought get ready to jump him for breaking in. But he takes all their powers. Damn! Duo shows up, saddened for his lateness, explaining that that robot is the source of all evil energies in the galaxy. And it was Duo's mission to stop him. Which he actually did do when they had this whole DBZ battle up in space. Good stuff. But despite that, they both ended up crashing and being destroyed. Unfortunately, some square head, I wonder who, actually repaired the evil robot relatively perfectly compared to Duo, who roasts light for giving him such a crummy body. Sensing Maestro's strong sense of justice, he gives them his arm in order to stop this evil robot. Maestro, Duo fist equipped, marches their way over to the broken to ceiling where they start ascending, and I mean they launch themselves into space. I'm not making this up. Like dang, I didn't know you could fly. That would have been nice on the Gamma fight, but hey, you go buddy. So now we're up here playing Psychic Force in space. This rules. How this fight works is that Evil uses one of the powers the Mega Man 8 robots have and performs a super attack that you have to dodge. Afterwards, he rushes at you, where you have to fist him. This is the only time he's vulnerable, so it's a wait fight, but I don't think that's a bad thing, because this is a very visually cool fight. Because you're flying, I recommend binding a fly down button to help you with dodging some attacks. Jump is basically fly up, so you don't have to worry about that. I didn't bother doing so, because I didn't feel like it, and I figured it wouldn't be used elsewhere, but then I ended up doing it later, like, three chapters from now, so I guess joked on me. Halfway through, he starts doing two attacks at once, leading to some pretty nasty combinations. Because I didn't bind to fly down, this electrical attack was absolutely slapping me up. Not a hard fight, and a pretty cool one. Sad I didn't seek all the attacks, but I've seen enough evil robot players in CBM to know what I'm getting into. We destroy him, as his body breaks apart into different directions, which yes, will be very relevant for the story going forward. Duo watches on proud as Maestro saves the world once more. The credits here are pretty neat because you get to see some fan robot masters. I mean, technically most robot masters are fan made, but quiet. There's some pretty awesome designs here, but my favorite has to be Flurry Man. Like, oh my god, he's so cute. Yeah, I just love cute stuff, and this is a godlike design to me. 
Also made by Splendid Land, who is someone I see very often. Like, god dang, she's even in the credits of the next game I'm talking about. What are the odds? In the post credit sequence, it's revealed that Wily was the one who repaired the evil robot. Duh. He has a sample of the evil energy of this robot and is preparing to research it. In the meantime, announcing that a king will be coming to rule soon. Oh, here we go, this crap. <laughs>
I wonder if Dr. Light is just used to random mail like this. Like, oh, yep, just another day. <laughs> Regardless, we get a message from our future king saying it's time to stop being slaves to the humans and instead be his slave <laughs> or something like that. And honestly, I'm about it. Sorry, humans, but you heard the king. We also get a farewell letter from Duo. Light tells us to stop King, but commotion outside reveals Base, and he's here to clap, but not us. No longer interested in serving humans or robots, he wants to fight King, and wants us to team up with him. Now we got a powerful squad, so you gotta wonder where the hell Proto Man has been. Like the dude just shows up with the clutch every few chapters and then dips. Also I like this joke of how it's usually Tango hiding up here away from Rush, but now that Treble's here, they're both hiding up there in fear. In a fresh breath of air, we're now playing Mega Man 8-bit team deathmatch. We get Mega Man and Base on our team versus robots that joined King, signified by Team Yellow. Partner AI is kind of useless, they basically just feed, but they might get a kill or two. I feel like Base would probably be that kind of guy that would get mad at his kill being stolen by his teammates. I really like the Robot Museum, it's a really cool map. I usually just stick to the exterior of the map, but the boat on the inside is a really neat set piece. Tengu Man. Again? Yeah, Rockman and Base kind of sort of reuses Mega Man 8 Robot Masters. Because it was made around the same time as Mega Man 8, but it was like a SNES game. You know how it'd be. Anyways, I play on this map a lot. I don't really have much to say on it. It has some neat ways to navigate it. Astro Man B's got some great jams. I like this map. And if there's one thing I remember from playing Deathmatch on it, it's where you can get your hands on Astro Crush. Astro Crush basically lets you point in a direction and annihilate anyone in your way with meteors. You're very vulnerable during it, but it's super fun to use. Dino Man's is pretty interesting, having the two sides split apart by the massive conveyor belt. Though this is uh, another map where the AI fails to function. Like, I was wondering where everyone was, but as it turned out they would just get stuck here on this conveyor belt. Made things pretty easy overall. Cold Man's map rules. Like, this map is hilarious. The ice sliding here with the ramps can get you some fun movement. And the underwater areas are pretty great as well, but the highlight are the ice block machines. They launch out these big ice blocks that will almost always result in someone getting killed by them. It's always funny, even if it ends up being me. It's extra funny if you're playing Team Last Man Standing, and this is how the last player loses their life. Awesome map. Structurally, I think Ground Man's map is great. It's just a visually interesting map. A part of me likes it, but that's because of how much I've played here, because I feel like it's probably not that great. A lot of the open areas have the slow sand on the ground, making traveling around kind of difficult, and I feel like if you stand on the upper areas, you can sort of just camp while the people below get stuck in the sand. It does have zap lightning, and that's always fun. I love Pirate Man's map aesthetic. Any custom maps using the same set rules. This is also my first time playing on this version of it, the older version was basically a completely different map, but I think the mixing of the water and land areas is done super well. This just feels like a big map with a lot to explore and do. This would be great with a lot of players. I really like this one. Burner Man is a neat map. It has some long hallways and the open areas get firebombed every once in a while, although the AI doesn't really seem to cooperate well here. I'm pretty middle on the road on this one, I prefer the more closed in areas when compared to things like these long hallways. Though despite what I just said, Magic Man's definitely is not my favorite map. Quite a bit of tight spots and obstacles about, mixed with some stair climbing that will get you killed half the time for attempting it. Maybe I just need to get better at jumping stairs backwards. You know what? Skill issue. My team hard threw near the end here so I had to end up doing it again, but with that, we're finally here at King's Castle. Base rushes off to fight King while Mega Man chases him, wanting to settle things peacefully. So we're all alone in a match where everyone wants to jump us. This isn't bad really, because the only way these guys can win is if they score on me 15 times. 
Don't have to worry about them getting fragged on others like a normal deathmatch or on my teammates and teams. So this is actually pretty nice. But it is crowded. We got all the robot masters from Mega Man and base here. I like all the rooms this level has. The deathmatch experience here is definitely a lot different than Team LMS where you just get jumped at spawn. Full of fun weapons too. Glad to see they're still keeping up the tradition of good penultimate levels in these chapters. Alright, let's face King. At the entrance, we find Mega Man in base, having been defeated by King. Dang, y'all are sorry. Does the base show have to do everything? We go in, where King gives a speech discussing his views. How robots are forced into roles to do work of the humans. Despite being superior, they are their potential hindered by the restrictions of humanity. And I'll be honest, I definitely agree with him. But Maestro's with the humans, and honestly I don't need any humans telling me what to do. But I also don't need any self-proclaimed kings telling me what to do. So have at thee. King has a shield that will counter shoot projectiles when shot at. So you have to wait for him to start shooting these easy to dodge giant X's. Or you can just use copy vision and aim it at it in a way that you're still hitting King even with his shield up. Which just does absolutely massive damage like uh... What, what's going on? But there's a second phase. Ditching his shield, he propels himself at you with his axe. Shooting basically a Gemini laser every once in a while. He still gets absolutely melted by copy vision here. And ammo refills respawns. So, uh, yeah, and that's the fight. Yeah. Surprisingly easy. How did Mega Man and Base lose this? I mean, I imagine Base just tried a machine gun fire with his buster at King's shield and got demolished. And Mega Man probably tried to talk friendly and got chopped. King doesn't understand why Maestro fights for humankind, and honestly neither do I, but respects them regardless. He decides from his defeat to call off this war. Unfortunately, the Clown Fiesta is approaching at mock speed and prevents him from calling this war off. You may have recognized these silhouettes, and yes, it's the Genesis unit from the Wily Wars. That's actually kind of cool. These three are here to keep the war going, as it's what their master, it's Wily people, want. They grab King and yeet him off the building. Now it's the new Kings, I guess. They head back to the Wily Tower, completely ignoring Maestro. Imagine if they knew that Mega Man was just behind the door behind them. What a mistake they made. Because we know Maestro is coming for them now. And honestly, I kind of messed with King. So I'm here to fight too. Light sends his robots to pick us up and tells Maestro to head to the tower and stop the Genesis units. Mega Man base are still being repaired. So we're teaming up with Light's robots instead. Honestly, awesome fan, you do you. We gotta hang out sometime, come on. But without further me wasting your time, it's time for the war on Wily. Isn't it cool how the campaign connects all these games and characters? Like, I think it's really awesome. I love the chiptune versions of all these Wily War songs. Still Team Deathmatch, and still only being paired with two other characters, but this time we're against Team Wily. Though maybe in some ways, we always war. I like the inside areas of Buster Raji, but I don't really mess with the open areas in the center outside. I'm not sure if I can say a map is good if I only explore like 50% of it. But I mean, I like this map, and it's personal preference. I like to running around on the inside, especially with the Maestro backhand. Come on. At the end of it, we fight Buster Raw G. He spins his staff to reflect projectiles, and he jumps up, striking with the Extendo Rod. He clones himself at points, where you can get some extra hits if you find which clone is the real one, but you can also just chill out and wait for the real one to reveal itself. Not a hard fight, and definitely the easiest of the three Genesis units. Mega Water S is a memorable map. It's mostly focused on this underwater area here, but above it is this whole surface area you never really see people go to often. But I think hopping along the islands and shooting at people above the surface only to dive down and see more battles going on below is pretty cool. Hell, I'll say it. It's underrated. Okay, so the Mega Water S fight is actually pretty hard. You fight him on this small platform, 
Well, after a while of walking around, he'll shoot. So you kind of have to manipulate him into a position where he's leaning towards one side of the platform rather than being in the middle, or you'll find it very hard to fight him, just in terms of dodging his attacks. After a bit, he'll blast you to the outside into the water. So the jellyfish that spawn here can actually destroy you. Like the damage they do, watch out. And if that wasn't enough, Mega Water S is still shooting you. And if you miss the platforming, that's death. There's some copy webs on the side here. Wave Burner and Search Snake. I don't really bother with Search Snake, but Wave Burner can melt him. This fight took me longer than it probably should have. Hyperstorm H is a pretty good map. Always like chilling around on the upper path here, but I enjoy the whole map overall. It's nice to just run around with Hornet Chaser and Drill Bomb. Great time. Maybe I was just getting impatient, but Hyperstorm Age kind of wrecked me too. Like, dude got two health bars? Help! He sucks and blows you in different directions, and you gotta be careful not to go overboard because you're surrounded by insta kill spikes. He also has a charging ram that can knock you overboard too. And this is the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch boss battle, so you know what he does shockwave damage when he lands after a jump. It's definitely a unique fight, and all these bosses are, and that's why they're highlights of the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch in general. It's always cool to see what this fight can be in a 3D environment, you know? Wily Tower 1 rules. The outside area with the lava, the interior sections, the water part. There's a surprising amount to this map. It's just one of those maps I could talk about all day. So many different obstacles too, fire pillars, the moving platforms, the fire waves, crushers, conveyor belts, it's packed. Great map. Okay, Wily Tower 2 is pretty nice also. So I haven't been mentioning the teammates that much because they're just lights robots, but here we got Proto Man and question mark, question mark, question mark, who's that? Also, hey Proto Man, I love how he really does just show up randomly. <laughs> So I'm looking around to find out who this question mark person is, and then I see god dang Otto running around. Clown all you want, but I am not kidding. Otto is the best AI partner I had yet. Seriously, he went on like a 4 kill streak. I was popping off. I low key thought god dang Cutman Mike or someone just joined in on the campaign and started scoring. Pop off. Anyways, fun map. Always had a good time shooting down this long staircase here. A lot of freedom with this map and I enjoy that. And thanks for the carry, Otto. Alright, time to stop screwing around. Let's take on Wily. We get on an elevator as Wily appears in his castle behind us. He tells us how he has a sample of the evil energy, which he'll use to take over the world, before we arrive at an arena. And... Okay, this fight is awesome. You got the whole Genesis unit here, and a super good song too. This has to be one of my favorite fight themes. The three of them move around, mimicking some of the attacks from their respective boss fights, but it's not overwhelming because we're aware of this because we've already fought them individually before. Game design. But after certain points, they do these like team attacks, like Hyperstorm Beyblading around while Buster Rod pokes you, Hyperstorm spinning Buster Rod around and creating this jump rope scenario while you're being chased by Mega Water, Hyperstorm sucking in Buster Rod clones that you have to dodge while avoiding Mega Water's water pillars, and you're out here dodging these with Tengu Smash? This fight rules! Yo! They all share the same health bar, so targeting whoever you think is the easiest is a good idea, but you can also use Tengu Smash to line them up and slash through all of them, which is some big ol' damage. This is definitely one of my favorite fights. I'm glad all these chapters can end with such a memorable and cool fight, you know? Like seeing them get together and do all these team attacks and crap, like, my god, I love this stuff. Upon defeat, a score ball is dropped onto the arena. And I figured I might as well go for the high score. My run was looking pretty stellar already. But much like going after the score balls in Mega Man 1, it was a huge mistake. As Wily appears behind us in his skull suit. I guess this chapter isn't over yet. Nah, I'm playing. Maestro actually does blast him up this time. 
Wily, undeterred, hits that self-destruct button and runs for it. There it goes. But make sure I ain't no slacker and gives Chase as the credits roll. Cool art too. I love Maestro's just blank stare as Wily's running for his god dang life. But yeah, that was pretty neat. I was actually thinking about how nice teammates would be to switch things up during the duo chapter. And even if it may not make that much of a difference, I think it still works to mix things up. And I'm glad these chapters did switch it up to a team deathmatch. Wily ends up tripping on a pebble or something and falls over. As his Wily capsule comes and picks him up, while Maestro kind of just sits there and watch. Maestro's funny. I like this robot. We get a cutscene after the credits referencing a few weeks later, a discussion between King and Light. King, surviving the Yeet, called off the war and reconciles with Light, ultimately deciding to find his own path in life rather than aligning with anyone. Good for him! Alright, I like to think these previous chapters have been built up because what's coming next is the best parts of the campaign, hands down. We're approaching the peak, and this is one peak that will not be going down at any point from here on out. We get a message from Splash Woman, one of Light's old robot masters, saying that in the interest of living past their expiration date, they are back and reprogrammed. She's kind of vague about it, but it doesn't sound good. Anyways, let's go report this to Dr. Light like we always... Hey, Otto! What's up? He tells us that Dr. Light is out on a business trip, in jail. This is due to the older robot masters escaping and causing havoc, because surely the guy who created a robot that has ended up saving the world several times is behind this. Yeah, surely. Listen, I'll roast the Mega Man 9 plot another day, but Rock and Roll are out there trying to prove Light's innocence. Otto wants us to help by bringing back the rogue Light numbers, and I mean, and don't worry baby, we'll take care of this. And I'm a pretty big fan of some roguelike games myself, if you catch my drift. Remember how I was hinting that the AI was going to change so that certain weapons work better against them? Well, this is when that happens, as the AI now jumps rather often, and listen, I never jump. If you see me jump in a fight, that means I am shook. The problem with jumping is that while it might save you once or twice, it puts you in a position that gets extremely punished if you're being looked for, which we'll see pretty soon. Concrete Man stage has always been pretty mid for me, it just doesn't do much for me, you know? Black Hole Bomb is in the center pillar, I tried reaching it with the Concrete Man's weapon, but it didn't really work out. Don't worry, we'll get to BHB later. Tornado Man's map is pretty open, but not in a painful way. I think this one is pretty good. I like the freedom between running alongside the ground or choosing to go and attack from higher areas. I like maps that I can explore like this. It was also here I noticed the AI changes. I wouldn't say it makes the AI more difficult, but it does make them funny to fight against. They still slide back and forth, but you can think of the jump like an exploitable weakness. Trust me, you'll see how I take advantage of this later, but it basically lets you use more weapons, and I think that's really good. 
Splash Woman. I'm pretty mixed on this one. Even with Bubble Bomb to pull me over, I think I like it. Having the mixture of areas of ground and water, but I, I don't know. Now with the AI doing these high water jumps, it's kind of just annoying waiting for them to come down. Though I guess I could be hitting them out of the air. Mm, skill issue. Plugman's map is fun. Plug balling the lower areas, taking that long Yoku block platforming section and getting shot off by literally everybody in the server. Fighting on the above floor, I like it. This is where I really started to punish the new AI. See, I'm a firebender maestro player. In other words, I live and die by fire copy weapons like magma bazooka. And if you jump against someone charging magma bazooka, every time. This was actually the funnest part of the campaign for me because I would just do this. Like a lot of the footage you are about to see is me calmly charging magma bazooka as my opponents jump and I blast them. I am sick and unwell, but this, this is my therapy. Jewel Man's map is another great one, get used to hearing that often. The rooms just work out and I enjoy fighting in these. Also got my hands on black hole bomb so we can talk about it. I believe it works by holding mouse one down and steering the black hole and then releasing it for the attack. It's actually pretty fun to use and powerful at that. I didn't really play Galaxy Man in any of the class based mods but I can see the appeal. This is pretty satisfying. Hornet Man's map is definitely one of the best maps out there. The long hallways work because there's a ton of cubby holes leading to different parts of the map. Areas such as this large room with the spring rows on the side make for so many interesting fights. Sneaking around the upper areas and firing from up top is really cool too. Awesome map. Oh no, it's magma man, you know what this means. If there's any miners watching this, just look away. Because what you're about to see is, it's not for the safe of heart. It, it just never ends. This map is a blur as I stared my victims in the, well, legs, as they jumped up in the air, awaiting my bazooka. Very aesthetically exciting map with the falling lava. I like the mixture of all these areas hidden away from the battles from the large open area where everyone is firing at each other. It's intense. You can freeze the falling magma, which I guess creates a safety wall. I'm not really sure why you would do this. Meanwhile, I'm running around the map blasting people with the charged super shotgun. I'm sorry that you all have to see me like this. It's not pretty. But every once in a while I have to show my true colors and this... This is the results of it. Galaxy Man is a rare sicko type map. It's full of these springy teleporters that send you around the level so it's kinda degen. But you do get your hands on the black hole bomb pretty easily. I can imagine deathmatch just consisting of everyone using the black hole bomb here. What a party. We get back to Otto, who finds out that this is Wily who tampered with Light's old robots, and he's going to use this as evidence to get Light free. Meanwhile, Tornado Man and Splash Woman have switched to help us, and wants us to storm Wily's fortress. Uh, yeah sure, let's go. Wily Castle entrance is one I like a bit. I love how the background switches up when the match is about to end. I tried to platform to get this copy weapon I haven't seen before with concrete shot, but I don't know. I'm not good at this. It's time to face Wily though, and I have a feeling this might be the hardest fight yet. We run down the hall in anticipation, and as we arrive... No, 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 I'm just playing, I'm just playing on that one. Wily is surprised to see us here, considering what's happening elsewhere. Maestro has no idea what he's talking about as he shows us a news report. In it, we see New Metropolis attacked by robots. We even get to see Proto Man blast the news reporter. Damn! Wily chastises us for choosing to come here instead of saving the city. And meanwhile, I'm like, well dang, let's make this trip worth it then. Nah, I'm just playing. He's just a small old softy, but they're cool, so it's okay. Wally offers us a trip to the city so we can help out. 
But I'm not sure about this. I mean, this isn't exactly the safest form of travel, you know. I'll give him one star on Uber later, but we're getting dropped into the center of all of it. Fake man stage, I believe? This is a pretty interesting scenario, as you get jumped by a bunch of cops for no real reason, which is pretty realistic where I'm from. This is a team fight, and everyone's against you. It's pretty tough at first until you get your hands on the black hole bomb, then it's pretty easy. You might have noticed that, interestingly enough, we're on Team Wily this time, fighting off against Team Light. The map on its own is pretty good, maybe a little ladder intensive, but I don't think it's anything too awful. Both out of the way, we escape the police. We find ourselves on a burning building, where upon looking outside, So cool. Awesome song too. So how this fight works is that you need to jump over Proto Man's shield bashes. He'll sometimes throw his shield and charge a charge shot, which will either aim at you or aim at his shield, which will then ricochet back at you and hit you, so you have to pay attention to which way he's facing. I struggled a lot with his jump shots at first, but I think you need to jump over his final set, but you may be able to also run under him. We defeat him. He tells us to finish him off, but we all know Maestro would never. Mega Man intervenes anyways, wondering what's wrong with Proto Man. All is interrupted as this giant plane flies by, spreading some sort of gas. Proto Man reveals this all to be a virus, but he can't finish his sentence. Mega Man tasks us with stopping that robot and trusting us to rush for help. Well, they're screwed. Now flying with Rush this time around, we begin battle. This is one of the more interesting fights of Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch, and that's saying something. We're shielded off by invisible walls to certain sections, where we need to destroy parts of the robot. Missiles of a variety of colors are shot at us, and we need to destroy them. Red ones are normal, green ones split, blue ones freeze, and yellow ones give health, but be careful if you shoot the yellow ones too early, you can't actually get the health, they'll be out of bounds. After finishing a section, a cutscene plays where Maestro automatically moves on to the next area, but the first time this happened, it kinda glitched out, and I was still in control of Maestro, leading to a rather bizarre and confusing moment. I was like, oh, we do an alternate camera gameplay now, or... I ended up getting stuck giving the robot a big ol' kiss before getting blasted. This fight has a lot of phases, like at one point a dragon comes out and you have to start fighting it, that's pretty rad. Remember I said I eventually binded a fly down button after the evil robot battle? Yeah, it was for this fight, as during the final phase it's basically required. It's a really cool fight in terms of all the attacks that you have to deal with. Bullet hell patterns are just so pretty. We defeat the ship. News reports on it, but... The robots on the news are soon infected by the virus, implying that maybe shooting down this shark robot wasn't a good idea. The credits roll over this shot, and I really like the song that plays here. I don't know where it's from, and it's not listed anywhere, so I guess it's just part of some Mega Man soundtrack. Remember, I'm a fake fan. I just think the robots are cute. But hit me up with the name of it sometime if you don't mind. After the credits, Wiley reveals that this was all part of his plan, with the virus poised to turn all robots into killing machines. We see a conversation between Ringman and Dr. Cossack. Yeah, he's still relevant, imagine that. They know what this virus is and they need a plan. We watch as Cossack is working on repairing... Hmm... I wonder who that could be. He's discussing with another character about the virus, with the belief that as long as Maestro is still fighting that there is hope, and the key to victory may be this one robot he's repairing. As the two continue to talk, it becomes clear that he's talking to none other than King. King decides to help stop this, in order to save his fellow robots and his creator from destroying himself. God. That's so cool. Like, you don't understand how hype I was here, seeing all these characters we previously met coming together to form a plan while everyone we've been around are basically screwed. This is the kind of stuff I want in a Mega Man plot. Like, yes. 
bring back these characters and do cool things with them. And that's what I like about Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. It's a big intertwined story of all these characters. This is the kind of stuff I wanted from Mega Man that I will only ever get from fan work. And let me tell you, this next chapter changed me. As I said in a tweet, I have a spiritual connection with anyone who has beaten this chapter. We came out changed people. We get a letter in the mail describing the symptoms of this Robenza virus, encouraging us to stay inside. Semi-topical. The Mega Man 9 robots are all here now, which is pretty cool. Catch me chilling it out with Hornet Man, you know how it is. Down the elevator, we find Light working on repairing Mega Man and Proto Man. Galaxy Man's bouncing all about, talking about some space-time anomaly. Like, buddy, we got bigger issues. Plug Man has this boss refighting thing, which is cool, but I think you can only refight bosses you've actually beaten, so I'm still going 0-1 against Punk. I go up to where Light usually is to find Tornado Man. He tells us Mega Man started attacking people and had to be taken out, and tells us to go down there and talk to the doctor, which is pretty funny because I was actually just down there, Tornado Man. You know that? Whatever. Let's go again.
We reboot to Light talking about the virus, how it was sent out by Wiley, and how nobody can find a cure. Until now. As it appears Maestro, who just had it, somehow cured themselves. Light harnessed this energetical cure to cleanse Mega Man and Proto Man. Seeing how Maestro's immune to the virus, Light tells us that we gotta go out there and see if Wily has a remedy for his robots, warning us that infected robots will become more aggressive and obtain new abilities. He adjusts their weapon to output the same healing energy, allowing us to cure any affected robots we come against. So in other words, the cure to Robenza are these hands, baby. Also don't worry, everyone's fine out here. As Galaxy Man puts it, they're all kind of just used to getting blasted by Maestro at this point, so this is just another day. Low key though, Roll was definitely popping off. Maestro's lucky that she didn't have her broom on hand, or that would have been a wrap. Anyways, let's get started. Blademan's map is pretty cool. This castle area where you can move alongside the walls, fight in on the inner walls, or the interior itself. Despite this chapter being dope, it's extremely tough gameplay wise. As you can see, robots are getting infected by different types of the Robenza virus. Each type of the Robenza virus gives that robot a color shift alongside new abilities. Turning invisible, increasing attack speed, speeding up, spread shot, flying. I'm not sure if this is done as a cool nod, or if it was just easy to Im implement, but a lot of these are just runes. Most of y'all probably don't know what I'm talking about, but runes were a thing in Skull Tag. They were basically these overpowered as hell power ups that lasted until you died. I mean some of these were pretty tame, but stuff like spread and rage? They were pretty fun in co-op modes all things considered, but it's really cute to deal with the BS these things bring in deathmatch here. Upon defeating an enemy, they become cured, but they still get the virus again like 30 seconds later. I didn't think they were at first, but the rules are still the same. It's still deathmatch with a frag limit. There's a thought process to be had here on whether you should target infected robots as soon as possible or try to go for the weaker non-infected ones to rack up score, but you gotta realize that the infected robots are super strong, and they will start scoring on you real fast depending on what type of Robenza they have. And if an infected robot get killed by anyone else, they don't get cured, so you have to be the one to get the last hit. So you're basically playing deathmatch, but you went to a server where somebody left SV cheats and able to one. Like some of these are fine, but when you're trying to fight a flying enemy? Yeah, that's a GG. Put me in another game, I'm out. Luckily, we're still playing with the friendlier AI, so you can still use a wider array of weapons. Hell, Triple Blade is a pretty good weapon for jumping enemies, even if I just run up and use it like a shotgun. Hey, I think Doom broke me, I'm not gonna lie. Anyways, this stuff can be really hard, Maybe not for the best reasons either. Case in point with the next level, Pump Man. This is probably the worst experience I ever had playing Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch's campaign. It's a water map. I don't care that there's a small land area on the surface, everyone fights in the water. And it is just absolutely painful with the virus AI. One of these Robenza types gives the robot magnetism, and getting magnetized and dragged around in the water from god knows where is painful. Like, please, no more magnetism gimmicks, I beg you. The jumper I made water levels so much worse. Fighting this is just not fun. The best strategy I could find in this level is just copying what the AI was doing. Spam screw crusher and hope you score on the AI. Which keep in mind, the AI can be coming at you with Rage Screw Crusher, or even worse, Spread Shot Screw Crusher. Like, good luck dealing with that, and good luck trying to get kills with that going on. And if you get magnetized into Screw Crusher, you're already done for. I love this chapter, but gameplay wise, I think it's pretty painful. But I'm still glad that this was put in regardless. 
It is a mix up and it makes the chapter memorable, even if not in the best way. I actually haven't seen most of these maps, which is pretty surprising. I mean, I would never put Pump Man's map in my rotation, but I think Commando Man's map is pretty cool. A blend of outside and inside structures tightly packed together, and I think it works. But I'm playing party mode right now, so I might not be able to give the best opinions. I was only winning this because I was spamming treble sentry. Chillman's map is great though, I've played on this one before. I was surprised that Deathmatch has a very easy to reach teleporter you can spawn right next to that teleports you to an easy lightning bolt. Like yeah, thanks for the win. The areas you can only get to by shooting the ice walls are pretty cool. A lot of ways to get around on this map. Sheepman's map is pretty complex with the design. As my first time playing, nothing really stuck to me. But I do think the focus on copy weapons that bounce off walls like Plug Ball, Rebounder, Crystal Eye, Wild Choreo is pretty funny and I like the theme. Sheepman's still my bestie too. Like, if you got a problem with him, you got a problem with me. Watch out. Also, Thunderwool is pretty fun on a map with a low ceiling. Strikeman has some fun areas to fight in, and even incorporates the platforms you have to shoot in order to rise up. I always like how these gimmicks carry over, and I'll only use them like one map to make it distinct, just like the official games. See, me and Strike Man, we go way back. You know, I think Mega Man 10 was like, my first ever Mega Man game, you know? And I've never actually beaten it, at least I don't think so. But Strike Man was like, my first ever Robot Master I fought. So seeing this level is actually pretty nostalgic to me. I think I might be the only one like that. I mean, I came in late. But to be fair, I've only really started living like two years ago. Anything before that is just a blur that I've been burning away from my mind. But maybe with how life's going so far, I'm still not alive yet. Also, Hornet Chaser rules on this map because I can actually deal with the flying AI. That's nice. Because on some maps with the weapons, you just can't deal with the flying AI. This chapter started out painful, but it's definitely gotten better, and I think the maps are really helping. Oh wait, never mind. It's Nitro Man's map. Nah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Nitro Man's map is pretty silly. It's very small, and it has these roads where these cars come out to wreck you. They can be destroyed pretty easily, but definitely gave me a scare first time around. It's definitely a pretty funny map. Solar Man's map is a really good one. Pretty decently sized with a plethora of places to go to, and getting your hands on the hook shot opens up even more routes. Kinda tough when Metal Man is just running around the map with spread rune, but that's just how it be sometimes. After that, we find Wily's hideout off in the distance. We approach to find it heavily guarded, only for two mysterious figures to appear, planning to storm the place as well. I think it's pretty obvious who these two are, you know, considering. Well, I'll just keep you on the dark for now. Let's just say that these two are the greatest power couple of 20XX, and I'm proud of them. They're here to clap, and I'm not going to stop them. Wily Archives is another map I enjoyed. I like this mosh pit junkie area that's kind of like a hub leading to all the other spots on the map, alongside battling out in the outside spots. Any map that I can run around and backhand people with slash claw is an easy run to me. Going further, we get caught by Wily on CCTV, and he knows he's about to get shaken baked when he turns around and he sees this looking in the camera. Surprised that Maestro has a cure, he challenges them to meet him at the top of the tower, in one piece, or many. The Weapons Archives boss is disgustingly difficult. It's a boss that replicates previous bosses we have fought, and there's multiple phases to it. First round is against Doc Robot, Darkman 4, and the Met Daddy. None of these fights for this phase are particularly hard, so I wouldn't waste any copy weapon energy on these ones, because it's gonna get a lot harder. Next phase, we fight Buster Rod, G, Duo, and King. The next up, we fight Proto Man, Bass, and Copy Mega Man, which can be really scary considering Bass's Crescent Kick and Copy's Pharaoh Shot potentially destroying you. The kicker is that there aren't any checkpoints, I died on phase 3 and I had to go all the way back to the first set. Sure they give you a little set between the fights, but it's still brutal adjusting and trying to remember how to dodge all these attacks again. Wily Apex is the penultimate map, and while it's not as great as the others have been, 
It's interesting in the way that the others haven't been. Though maybe that's just because I was still fighting the Robenza AI. Skill issue. It's an interior map designed around low gravity. Having a lot of vertical areas, you would need something like a hookshot to even dream about getting to normally. I feel like this is the best map that has handled the low gravity mechanic. In some ways it feels like we're playing a different game. You can say this is just the same as the water map, but I don't know. It doesn't feel the same. I think you have more air control in low gravity, or maybe you fall a little faster, I'm not sure, it, it feels different. I want to play on this map more, I like the design idea here. Regardless, it's time to face Wily, and oh man, does this fight rule. Wily, seeing Maestro is still alive, is planning to discover their immunity by destroying them with his own two hands. Alright, let's see what you got. What? Did you think this was gonna be that lame as hell boss from the original Mega Man 10? Get real. Yeah baby, it's the Wily Golem from Mega Man 4 on Game Boy. Now we're talking. The first phase of this boss revolves around damaging the green button that opens up at certain time intervals while simultaneously dodging attacks. These attacks range from a flamethrower that you have to run behind the fist on, a ground pound fist that you have to jump, and an avalanche attack that you have to prey on, but it can give you some health and weapons in the form of Pharaoh Shot and Rebound Striker. The only one I don't really mess with is this Junk Wave attack. Like, I still don't know how to dodge this. I only won because I got lucky that I didn't roll this attack too often. Maybe you have to stay inside and jump over the arm? I'm not sure. The arms have a hitbox on their own. Upon defeat, Wily grabs Maestro, ready to tear them apart. But don't worry, because that's when the power couple from earlier show up. It's Duo and King, baby. They work together and take out the arms. It's over. They both tell Wily to surrender, that this was never what he wanted. But Wily's gone too far, and he's not going to stop now. It's phase two time. And dear God, the song that plays here, Duo of Kings, Oh my, it's such a good song. Mixing a lot of duo songs from Mega Man 8 alongside King songs from Mega Man and Bass. It's almost like this game was made by people who love Mega Man more than Capcom themselves do. This fight has a variety of attacks, and you get Duo and King to help you out. These bombs you have to knock off the platform, this boomerang mustache, an attack that sucks you in and yes killed me once, and this projectile spread super explosion. There's something insulting about seeing Duo and King dodge it perfectly while I get hurt. It might actually just be a strat to stand on them and jump with them. To damage Wily, you have to wait for these moments where you hide behind King while Duo meteors the golem's head, revealing a weak spot that you need to shoot at during the intervals where you aren't getting blasted. It's definitely a pretty interesting scenario, using King's shield sort of like a cover mechanic. Like that's such a cool idea. With enough damage, Wily is defeated. Wily begs for forgiveness, wanting to help solve all the problems he's caused. Duo's like, hell nah, let's just kill him. And honestly, yeah that sounds pretty good to me at this point. This dude will never learn his lesson. But then freaking King ruins everything by protecting Wily. Like, no, King, it's not over. It's never going to be over. King drags Maestro into this by saying that they spared them as well, and I was just flabbergasted at what this dude was saying. Wily can change? We just need to show him mercy? Bro, that's what we've been doing. That's what Mega Man has been doing. Wily is still at it. Duo, you need to get off this planet. These people are hopeless. As we all begin to leave, Wily wonders how we were able to resist the virus. Duo says it's because he holds the opposite energy to that of the UFO robot. King couldn't harness the power, but for some reason Maestro could perfectly, which may mean that they're an alien. 
Or something like that. So how is King immune? One of the scientists used Duo's energy to create a cure. And baby, you know who that is. A star appears in the distance and travels right towards us, however, before Duo can tell us who made the cure. And yeah, it's Terra. One of the star droids, he's here to make everyone his slave. To do so, he's here to take Dr. Wily in need of a certain star belonging to him. In retaliation, Duo goes up and tries to fight Terra, but he gets absolutely destroyed. Like, god dang, man! Terra ends up taking Wily away, while King calls for an escape plan. Meanwhile, I'm over here wondering at what point we got teleported into a Dragon Ball episode. Maestro awakens in a lab as an unknown character talks, referencing working for the space division in the government, but their true passion always being robots. King's here too, and the doctor's installing an upgrade on Maestro. King leaves with the plan to help spread the Robenza cure to help save the planet from eating itself. I mean, we kind of already have a situation on our hands here about to screw the world over, but I guess we all know Maestro's gonna handle it. Maestro goes online once more, finally meeting the second MVP of Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch. The non-playable MVP because quite honestly, Cossack's throwing the world on his back right now. He reveals that this whole time, Cossack's robots were never aligned with Wily at all, instead just being double agents to report all of Wily's doings to him. And upon discovering that evil energy was being used to make a virus, he contacted Duo to make a cure immediately. Godlike. But that's not all. He reveals that there are more star droids out there, and Cossack built a f***ing spaceship that we're now riding on. Double godlike! The star droids are attacking different planets of the solar system, already enslaving one of these robots with the promise of a cure, and we're gonna use this spaceship to fly around and beat Square. Maestro's been upgraded with the Mega Arm, changing their normal buster to be a charge attack that attaches to enemies and deals damage. This will be important, as this chapter has a major gameplay change. We can no longer collect copy weapons and maps. There's no weapon pickups at all. But to counter this, Hidden Carry Auto joins the crew, with the ability to make copy weapons that we get to keep permanently at the cost of some screws, which we can get from defeating enemies in the maps now. You can purchase weapons from his shop with this currency. I think this is such a good time for this idea. Like, this wouldn't work if this is how the game started out. We spent the past 11 chapters having to use any and all weapons we can get our hands on. By this point, we've already used basically every weapon. And now, the game is finally giving us the ability to use our past experiences to choose our favorite weapons to roll out with. By now, we know what all these do. And I know what you're thinking. Oh god, it's gonna start raving about Magma Bazooka again. Yeah, I'm gonna click off this video now. And no, because you don't get to choose what copy weapons appear in the store. So it's not just about choosing your favorite weapons immediately. It's about using what you have to buy weapons you like that are currently in the store. Instead of just gunning for your favorite weapon and trapping yourself into becoming a boring one trick pony with it. Instead, it's using your memories on which ones you like from what's currently in the store and being like, yeah, okay, I want to use that. I remember liking that one. Even if my favorite weapon's not here, I can still use something that I enjoy using and I want to use. That's called saving the player from themselves, aka good game design. Though with that in mind, I still ended up getting Magma Bazooka like instantly. In a fun twist, perhaps even referencing classic Mega Man, we actually get to choose what levels we want to go to this time. Yeah, I know. I chose Mercury first, 
only for the fact that I always really liked Mercury's theme and hearing it here is even better. Map gameplay is also a lot different now. We now have partner AI that unlike before, is actually really powerful. These are Cossack's robots, they have a ton of HP and can only use their special weapon, in this case Dustman using Dust Crusher. They have regen too, and if they get knocked out during battle they can't respawn. Furthermore, if you get knocked out during battle, that's a game over. Yeah, you gotta try again or play a different map. This turns us less into a focus on classic deathmatch, running around and trying to get more points than your opponents, to simply trying to survive. I mean the only way you can lose is if you run out of health, so camp strats and worrying about health are number one priorities, because you can still get destroyed on these maps, as all the opponent's AI will be using their specific weapon, and that can lead to some troublesome situations later on. So the way to win battles is to get enough frags that the boss of the map spawns, in this case Mercury. These characters have extra health, and can get really scary if you don't have your AI partner with you, which actually will end up carrying you a good amount this time. Mercury's map is cool, I don't need to say more as you've basically seen most of it. Come up with your own conclusion, okay? Next up, I was in the mood for some rotund action, and so I went to Venus, which luckily, I got a rotund homie of my own, and it's Toadman. Remember how I said that all characters from here on out just use their own weapons? Yeah. Toadman's out here running around the map with infinite ammo rain flush. Legendary, nobody can stop him. You also get the star droid's weapon upon defeating them. I always thought Mercury's weapon was kind of awful, but that also means that after this level, I'll get Venus's bubble bomb, and quite honestly, there's basically nothing more to life that I want than that. Venus's map is pretty fun, having bounce pads to cut into certain areas and move around. You may have noticed that I'm placing Rush down now, and that's because despite all the weapons you can get, getting Rush is the most important thing you can do at the shop. Placing Rush down, he will always dig up an item you can use. This usually ends up being energy and health refills, but every map has secret treasure locations that give you super rewards, such as massive money bigo screws and e-tanks and the like. You can find these secrets relatively easily, as Rush will face the direction of them if you dig close to one, hinting at where you should go to dig next. Whenever I found myself low on health, I would spawn in Rush and get that health refill. He's extremely useful, and while he may only have 10 uses at first, he can be upgraded to have infinite. I managed to get my hands on Lightning Bolt. You may think I scored well with getting such a powerful weapon, but the thing about Magma Bazooka and Lightning Bolt is that these are like self-destruction weapons. When you use these weapons, you are going to get punished, and while running in and dying to get a ton of kills is good in deathmatch, doing it here is just a speedrun to restart the level. Yeah, the same strats aren't going to work. This is Neptune's level, and we got Dive Man. I love the aesthetic of this level, going to the inside of the ship and exploring around. I think it's pretty good, even if the AI got stuck on the edges a lot. Neptune's got salt bubbles, which hurt as much as they sound like they would. But, just like I learned from school, you can solve any problem with a little fisting. There's more to do on the spaceship, such as Dustman allowing you to toggle weapons you don't want, so we don't have to deal with shuffling a ton of different weapons, which, spoiler alert, I'm going to have to deal with that anyways. You can find Pharaoh Man, who talks about these hidden treasures all across the world we have to dig up to find, referencing these pictures to potentially give us hints on where to go but the pictures are like 7 pixels, so you can't really tell what you're looking at. But he says we may be able to get something useful to fight the star droids with, and I'm like, yeah I'm good. <laughs> this idea of revisiting past levels to find these treasures is probably a really cool idea to the people who waited years for this update to come out. Unfortunately, while others may have been playing this over the course of decades, I've been playing this over the course of two weeks, and the last thing I want to do is go back to maps I just got finished playing. I'm good. Speaking of going back to places where you don't want to anymore, you can also find a teleporter to Light Slab. In case if you're wondering, all these teleporters we're taking that to these arenas and planets and the such can only be taken by robots, which is why you don't see Light here helping out, or Light teleporting across the world. Light wishes us the best of luck as he fixes up things here, with mail from King saying he's doing his best to cure everyone. I chose Mars next. 
Our partner is Skullman, who is incredibly useless and dies instantly. I think I saw him use Skull Shield like once, but I don't know, maybe it was a bug, maybe my vision was a little hazy, because all he does is just walk around the map with a Mega Buster and get blasted by everyone. This map took me a bit, not because it was terribly difficult, but because of these rather familiar switches. Hmm, where have I seen these? What planet are we on again? Mars. Huh. Well, let's see what happens when you activate all these switches. We're cooking now. They I even say we're kitchen ace and taking names. They chose the best song too. Like this rules. I always thought Mars Missile or whatever is kind of like donkey water. So getting it in my inventory kind of felt like a downgrade until I delisted it. Oh yeah, the map is pretty cool too. Nice to see it recently popping up in net games. It's how I found out about the secret. I like the giant tank set piece. That's pretty rad. I didn't have the time to say this before, but in case you're confused on where all these levels in Star George are coming from, it's uh, Mega Man 5 on Game Boy. Mega Man V, you know. After defeating Mars, we talk to Cossack, who says we only have 4 planets left. He speaks that he's been researching the areas that we've been going to, and finds that the Star Droids have been stealing components relating to energy transfer. Meanwhile, some... thing... scares Toad Man. Oh god. <laughs> Anyways, we're at Jupiter. And you know what? I can't stand Jupiter. But that's personal history. Jupiter's map is one of those maps that make me appreciate the visuals of Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch. I know when I record Doom, it's always in the spacey soundy patent and JPEG vision. So it may look a little less, but I think these maps are just gorgeous. When I die, I want to reincarnate as one of three things. An early 3D render model, an SNK background, or Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch level. Make it happen, people. But yeah, this map is cool. I like the top area that splits into three different pathways to move around. However... Uh... You may be wondering what I'm doing. Okay. So remember I said that Rush Dig has a secret treasure on these maps? Well, the one for this one is over here. I promise, I'll make this quick. But basically, I couldn't jump up there normally, so I had to use copy weapons, but I didn't have something like Tornado Blow or whatever. All I had was Ice Wall. So I came up with a plan to ride Ice Wall, jump off in midair, and land there. But as it turns out, this was going to be a lot harder than I initially thought. So basically, when you fall off an edge with the Ice Wall, you're counted as falling off. You can't jump. So you have to time the jump beforehand, but that's hard because you have to do the super duper double jump which I brought up in my jump maze video, which means you have to time your jump on the ice cube with the jump off of it, because you can't just spam jump 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 in doom, there's a delay between jumps, like all these attempts you're seeing me do, I'm holding jump the whole time, I'm set to have jump come out on the first possible frame, but it's not coming out because I messed up my first jump on the ice wall. And before all that, you have to make sure you tap the ice wall just right to have it all set up. Keep in mind, I had to take breaks with Rush to refill my weapon energy and hope that AI didn't show up and get in my way because my partner Brightman ended up killing everyone and I was afraid he was gonna drop Jupiter too. And in case if you're wondering, this took me about 30 minutes. You may also be wondering why I would bother wasting my time with this when I could have just grinded and bought a copy weapon that would have get me up there instantly. And what you have to understand is that I'm a fighting game player, and that should probably make enough sense, but I spend all day practicing combos that aren't even optimal just for the satisfaction of doing it. And by now, you're probably saying, Spacey, you are so cool, and uh, bruh, you don't need to tell me what I already know. Anyways, the reward I got for this was a trash as hell Mega Ball, which ironically could be used to get up here. Regardless, we slap up Jupiter, and by that I mean Brightman does all the work, which is pretty surprising because I didn't know Flashtopper actually really did anything besides Sendering Vision. 
Saturn was probably the hardest map for me. Shout out to the Cogdis stands, I'm one of you. But anyways, we're tagged with Ringman, who I'm surprised how much story time he got. I have a feeling the devs like Ringman, and I'll be honest, he is pretty cool. But yeah, this map was difficult. Whether it be Flame Man killing me with the fire he lays down on the ground, Napalm Man doing basically the same thing, Charge Man rushing me down until I die, or Gravity Man hitting you with the you die button causing me to instantly explode. We'd love to play this map to give a full opinion on it in normal deathmatch. It mixes normal areas with these areas of high and low gravity. Saturn Man has some weird as hell copy weapon I've never seen before. I think it was on that one Wily map that I tried to reach with the concrete shot. It like sucks you in and then explodes. It's pretty neat. Anyways, by the time he came out, Ringman was asleep. So I basically activated my complex doom mode and played like an ultra pop tart. Like I have never played so afraid in my life. Uranus's map is one I've seen pretty often. I like it. The outside areas with the pillars, the large area in the middle with all the different entryways and hallways connecting them. Like baby, that's a war room. And we're with Pharaoh man, so I feel pretty safe. Uranus has this weapon that's like super arm, but you throw two smaller rocks instead of one big one. It will be relevant and also irrelevant later on. Trust me. Alright, we got one star droid left. Any cat boys watching? Any cat boys in chat? Just playing around. I know you are, because it's Pluto. Because we're playing to survive rather than fast scoring, weapons previously too slow for me such as Hornet Chaser have become extremely helpful. I feel like I've been to this map a few times before but I can't quite remember. I like it though. Pluto has Break Dash, which to put it basically it's Bonko mode and I am not saying more than that. Well that's all the star droids, but there's still no sign of Wily. There must be a hidden base or something. A sudden shake comes by as the ship gets hit directly from behind. I guess Maestro will handle it. But before that, let me make sure I have the exact weapons I need. If you know what's coming up, you may be cringing as you see that I am not taking Deep Digger. So yeah, I may not be throwing boulders, but I am throwing the run. We go out to check the rear only for it to explode and we're suddenly grabbed by Terra. Hello Maestro. And tosses us away. We land on some planet, with Terra saying that he's ready to rip out Maestro's nuts and Volts for meddling with his plans. So let's fight. I know I say this every time, but come on, this is such a cool boss battle. I love how every time I say this, I remember the boss battle actually being pretty infuriating to deal with, but this one is unique. So Terra starts by shooting out his spark chasers that will zap towards you after a certain amount of time. There's no hiding, they have no clip. It's the only way Terra can really hurt you, so you just have to maneuver around them as they sandwich you, having their positions laid out subconsciously in your head. It's an interesting concept. After the spark chasers leave, he teleports, usually behind you, and charges up this freezing shot with incredible tracking. It's extremely difficult to avoid horizontally. No strafing can save you. You need to manipulate it by changing the height of yourself from when it originally fired to when it follows you. So if you're on the ground and it gets fired, jump over it by getting on the bumps. If you're on the bumpy, go under it. After another cycle of this, he surrounds you in spark chasers, but luckily we don't get folded like Duo did and we just have to jump. This is also the phase where Terra is the most vulnerable in, as during the spark chasers he sort of has a dodging thing going on. Eventually as his HP gets low, he starts shooting out 4 spark chasers, meaning you really have to remember their positions and maneuver them around in a pretty unique way. It's an awesome boss. But of course, finding all of this out, like how to dodge this or that, well you sort of just gotta get hit by it first. I'm a fighting game player, so while some of y'all might be crying, oh it's trial and error, I'd simply say, it's all part of learning the matchup. Anyways, as I hinted out earlier, his weakness is Deep Digger, which apparently if you hit him with while he's floating, he like staggers back and takes a lot of damage. That's a cool detail. As I was focused on dodging and didn't have a lot of weapons brought, I relied on Hornet Chaser homing and the likes of explosion weapons like Flash Bomb due to Terror standing still a lot. That's the neat thing about these fights going forward. It's that you get to bring your own weapons to them, leading to a lot of strategies unique to everyone. Stuff like Astro Crush and Lightning Bolt are awful because you're just getting hit for free. So quite a few weapons I got I found to be pretty useless against the boss fights. It's cool that everyone will have to use what they have to find their own answers to these upcoming fights. But at the same time, if I had certain copy weapons which I'll get into later, 
This fight would have been an ultra cakewalk. Terra's defeated, and no, that's not blood on his face. That's just my crosshair. Maybe I should have turned it off this playthrough. Regardless, we're too late. Terra's crew are planning to awaken him at the very moment. The Wily Death Star in the back shoots a massive laser, which honestly, this is a really cool visual. Maestro gets teleported out by Cossack. It looks like they ended up finding the hideout. Or well, I guess it found them. A massive weapon capable of decimating planets. Cossack comes with the plan of teleporting Maestro in there so they can disable the weapon from the inside. Really? All alone? Well, I guess if anyone can do it, it's Maestro. But hold up. Cossack reveals that he isn't sending in Maestro alone and has requested for special help. Who? Boom, baby. The boys are here. Ah, uh, hell yeah. Now this, this is a powerful squad. Let's go in and kick some butt. Wait, what the hell? Base, if you don't shut your stupid head looking cheating self up, I'm gonna have to blast you again. Make sure I hasn't even said anything. What do you mean? You know what? Listen up, base. Is that what they call this guy? Get a load of this. Do you know how much Maestro has been gaming as of late? Because they've been gaming up a storm. What have you done so far? Slapped us while we were down, only to get clapped by Maestro the next time? And you got slapped by King? Base, it's starting to look like your favorite Mega Man game is Mega Man 2. You better carry your weight this time, buddy. We're not going to be able to get some weapons for a bit, so I buy what I can, and with that, we're ready to set off. Oh man, this is awesome. The crew's all here to storm the base. This is gonna rock. Oh snap, I love this song. So, first off, we're teaming with Mega Man. He's not that great because he only has his Mega Buster, but hey, it does work in the main series games, I suppose, so why ditch it now? It's actually kind of funny that Maestro is like the mirror to how a lot of people play Mega Man, relying more on copy weapons rather than the standard buster. The same rules as usual apply here to us and our teammates, we got one life. I like the layout of this map. The center area is like a small box with a focus on verticality and having all these different floors to explore. This would be a blast with others. I didn't really get to explore it fully. But it's also nice to see a more vertically focused map every once in a while. Just kidding, Spacey from the future. I played some V classes on this joint with some other people. I love this map. This map is awesome. I like how you can travel along it with the teleporters and all the different pathways, but it always just leads back to the center. Just this huge vertical area of all these different floors of people shooting each other. Action happening right above and below you. You'll be shooting up at people, shooting down at people. They'll be shooting up at you and crap. Like, it's such a cool map. None of this is scripted, by the way. I'm just giving my thoughts. Anyways, so you might be wondering who the boss is that will appear after scoring enough points. And, well... Yeah, baby. The Mega Man killers are back. And no kidding. I mean, they jumped Mega Man immediately. Poor guy. Kind of scary considering you have to deal with Ballade Cracker and Screw Crusher. You're still extremely fragile. And one death is back to the beginning for you. I didn't think this is how I'd get my run back against Punk. But I'll take it. Well, Punk, it looks like you aren't gonna screw crush me this time. Mm, better not next time, Punk. Here's a map I do see fairly often, and I really like it. Just the kind of maps I enjoy, having a ton of different hallways and differently shaped rooms to explore the map in all these different ways. Interspersed with these larger arenas that these smaller hallways and rooms lead into, it always just sets up for these huge fights. Portal Man still isn't the greatest. These guys definitely aren't as strong as Cossack spots, and he ends up getting folded again at the boss. Speaking of which, it's the Mega Man killers again. They are on us. It's actually kind of scary running around the map all on your own, knowing these three bosses are lurking around and ready to end your run. But luckily, when you can bring your own copy weapons, you can find some lame game strats. Look at me, camping it out like a complex Doom player. You hate to see it. This is a fun map, small and simple. You can basically understand everything from a single glance. Base is our partner this time, and I'm gonna be honest, he might be the worst AI partner I've had yet. Like the dude didn't even make it to the boss. He got clapped so hard he tried to get a run back and glitched his way back into existence, but he still gets slapped. Like now I'm down two points when we both have one life. How does that even happen? Also, yeah, the Mega Man killers are back, and my strategies against them are getting sadder. 
Afterwards, Maestro finds Dr. Wily being held in a room. Dr. Wily, having no idea that people were actually progressing towards finding him, is shocked that even in space, he can't escape Maestro. He tells of how the Star Droids are using his fortress to power up a godlike being with the goal of wiping out all lesser beings. And they need to stop that robot from waking up or this world is over. And by they, I mean Maestro and Wily. Oh snap, I never saw this coming. Wily walking out with the skull suit. Wily always wins, baby. All right, all right, Wily pop off. And trust me, he's gonna pop off. Meanwhile, the Star Droids, surprised by Terra's defeat by Maestro, break open a canister of evil energy, infecting themselves with Robenza, which yes, means we're dealing with Robenza mechanics again. Oh goody. But you don't need to worry. Uh, you may have noticed Dr. Wily's health right now. Yeah, he's unkillable. And he's packing heat. He and I think alike. We've got the best weapons. Crash Bomb, Flash Bomb, Rain Flush, Astro Crush. b b b b b bars And also, b b b b b bubble bomb You know, I knew Dr. Wily had good taste. And I'm not just talking about Air Man this time. I like the map layout too. This area having these stairs and the god bot chilling in the chair is such a cool layout. But yeah, real strategy is just to chill out and let Wily handle everything. But you know Maestro, they want a piece of the action too. And there's something special about performing a double Astro Crush, it's kinda beautiful. After defeating them, we discover that we're too late, as the mysterious robot is being lowered into the core. Knowing that they're all basically screwed, Wily makes an escape through an escape pod telling Maestro that they can leave too, but he knows that as long as Maestro has hands, they're gonna throw him. Wily wishes them the best of luck, knowing that if Maestro fails, they're probably all screwed regardless. We go through this neat little mini dungeon involving shooting all these targets in a fast enough fashion before they reset. Times like these make me wish I had like gyro aim or something. Stuff like this is kinda hard for me on the mouse, or at least it stresses my hands out a lot. But we arrive at the core, where we meet him. No words, he just starts coming at you, grabbing you and holding you up before tossing you like trash. All the while you hit him with everything you got, wondering if you're even doing damage when suddenly... Ah, oh, hell nah, nah, get me out of here, get me out. This is Sunstar, okay. This fight is probably the hardest fight in Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch. Let's start with the moves. Three flame waves that explode against the wall, bursting into more flame shots. A massive charge laser that will kill you multiple times until you realize you have to jump over it. I hope you time it well or you're still going to take a lot of damage. A tracking flame that bounces off against walls. It may not seem like much, but it will likely deal the most damage and end the most runs for you. A fiery jump rope that you have to time, and a dash grab, where he tosses and damages you, and can actually combo it into other attacks. His grab may seem very easy to avoid, but if you haven't noticed what's going on here with his other attacks, there's a very cruel trick being played. Some of these attacks, such as the flame waves and the flame trail, purposefully force you to direct your focus away from Sunstar, and when you lose sight of him, that's when the grab comes out and chips you. After reaching a certain HP threshold, an intermission phase begins. It starts with you having to dodge a bunch of ground fires, and then these flame pillars, which can actually be pretty difficult. Though honestly, the real fight begins when he reaches low HP, and he gets that flary glow around him, because now all of his attacks are even stronger. He dash grabs multiple times, the jump rope is faster, his laser is this whole cycle that you have to perfectly time jumps over several times. Jumping flame waves exploding on the ground, this is one of my earlier attempts and you can see I almost won. Ah, so close. But surely that means I'm pretty comfortable to win this fight now. Nope, I still had 30 more minutes of attempts ahead of me. And that's because this run here, I got lucky. Somehow. In this run, he did not use his absolute worst attack on me. So basically, 
When he's powered up, he has a move where he rolls up in a ball and starts bouncing around. This is his worst attack. First of all, he's invincible, which means if he spams this three times in a row, you basically have to hold that. Two of two? I have no clue what, how you're supposed to avoid this attack. You can't outrun him, maybe manipulate bounce him against the walls? I don't know. But what I do know is that if he spams this attack, it's basically holding force damage while he's invincible. This fight was frustrating, to the point where I got hard tilted. Like, do you want to see what tilt looks like? Watch this. Yeah, <laughs> this fight took me several days. Like I would sit down, play, lose over and over, then say, I right, my day's ruined, and then go do something else. And I'm the kind of person who once it starts something, it has to finish it. So this just upset me more. But I was scheming, you know? Between breaks, I realized what I was missing. Actual weapons. No, seriously, a lot of my runs, I was running low on ammo, to the point where I started practicing charge shot only, so in the second half I could have ammo. So I began to think of buying more weapons to bring into the fight, and what weapons I should buy in the first place. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch made me grind. Yeah, I went back to Mars and I started farming the big screw on the tank until I could get all the weapons I needed. Remember how I said the Terra fight would have been a lot easier with certain copy weapons? Yeah, I meant the shields. Skull Barrier makes you invincible, so if there's any parts of the fight that you have trouble with, you can use it to tank a hit. For example, the fire pillars in the intermission or the rollout. However, that's also where Flame Wheel comes to play. There is a way to dodge the spin dash attack. Movement weapons like Charge Kick, Tengu Smash, and in my case, Flame Wheel are key. But the biggest carry of all? The best weapon hands down. Plant Barrier. Why? Because Plant Barrier heals you. And it heals you a lot. I'm not kidding, it's basically like having a second health bar. For offense, I already had a lot of the right ideas. After or during some of Sunstar's attacks, he stands still, making the likes of Flash and Crash Bomb pretty solid choices. Who knows, maybe you could drop an ice wall on him or something and see what happens. Electric Shock can also do some absurd damage, so I had the offense, I just needed the sustain, and the fight became a lot easier. The only annoying thing really is having to deal with cycling through all these weapons. It's here I really began to learn what each number keybind corresponded to with in terms of weapons, but still, stuff like Plant Barrier, Skull Barrier, and Flame Wheel are all on the same key, and all explosives are on the same key too. Which means if you're looking for a certain weapon, you may have to hit a key several times. Meanwhile, you're fighting Sunstar where your attention is already being diluted by all these attacks forcing you to quite literally look away from Sunstar. This fight is the reason I recommend easy mode to a lot of players not too comfortable with FPS games and the Doom engine, cause this is the first boss that really gave me a run for my money. Like the beginning of Sunstar's fight theme will be forever ingrained into my mind. I'm not the same after Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. But by some miracle, Maestro wins. Proving superiority, Sunstar asks Maestro to finish him. And we can all play a laugh track over that because we definitely know Maestro isn't going to do that. Sunstar is surprised by their actions, but tells them to leave, as his unstable Nova Core will likely cause... Uh... No way. Are you serious? Oh my god!
have fun dodging all of this. This fight is unwinnable, and you can't even damage him. You have to run. And this escape sequence is stressful, as you go through and you have to shoot the time switches again, all the while making a run out, avoiding the crushing walls and tentacles as this place falls apart. At one point we even encounter Terra, knowing that they have won as Sunstar's true power has been awakened. He laughs at Maestro's failure as the world will soon fall, and then he ends up getting crushed. Death was too good for you. But through this he gives us his spark chaser, which we can use to help navigate our way out. Finally reaching the end, Maestro hops on an escape pod and gets out of there. Meanwhile, everyone on board Cossack's ships are discussing what is happening, deciding it would be best to retreat and get ready to defend the world. Maestro's escape pod heads towards the ship, and Cossack's like, alright, let's get out of here. But luckily, Wily's got our backs, and tells Cossack to hold up for the MVP that's coming through. Wow. That... That was a lot. The screen fades, as a discussion amongst the world's three smartest people takes place. There's something extremely cool about seeing these three getting together and discussing a plan to fight a common, yet ultimate, enemy. They come up with a plan to destroy the Wily Star, but there's no weapon that can do that. So they're gonna build it. And luckily, we already got the blueprints for it. Yeah, Wily and Light's project they worked on together previously. Gamma. Meanwhile, Maestro's chilling out in a room when Mega Man shows up. They actually have a very interesting conversation. I was not expecting this game to pull out. As Mega Man envies Maestro for how much they've helped the world and how much they did while Mega Man was unable to do so. Reflecting on these emotions as a way that humans must feel sometimes. Wondering if he was built like this on purpose. It's a very neat character moment and I really like this. I didn't think this game would go that direction with talking about how Mega Man didn't really do a lot for the story. But I felt like they still respected Mega Man as a character. There were moments where he did get work done while Maestro didn't. It wasn't like this was just some sort of story where it's like, Oh, Maestro, super cool, OC, they make everyone look like trash, and all that. Nah, Mega Man was still going out, and he was still capturing Wily, and he got work done on his own. But it's still funny that this is Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch, yet sometimes it really feels like Mega Man is just a side character. I really like this moment. Like, I'm really glad it's in the game. Face shows up to tell Maestro that Wily is looking for them. As they only have a couple of days before Possessed Sunstar arrives, they had to use everything they got to build Gamma. So what we get is this moment of walking through and seeing all these different robot masters from the doctors working together. Like yo, this is awesome! You know, now that we're fighting evil energy again, Ringman's comments on Duo makes me reflect back and yeah. Duo kinda threw by getting himself killed earlier. Like yeah, nice plan man, we kinda need you now. But whatever, it's nice going around and talking to everyone. Plugman makes a Metal Gear Solid reference, though honestly he might just be a weeb. Snake tells us about finding Toad Man, which honestly, I'm getting real tired of him asking for Toad Man. He legit does it every time he's in a match throughout this entire game. Like yeah, we get it, you and Toad Man got some stuff going on, get a room. Also, why the hell are you just standing here? You gonna help buddy? Slacker! We also run into King as we see others going around and evacuating everyone. Because trust me, we're going to need this whole city to be cleared for what's about to happen. Ferroman's on some poetry crap right now, but he does remind me of the name of the enemy we're fighting. The Eclipse. We eventually encounter the three doctors with Gamma. Things are going to plan until a news report reveals that the Wily Star is hitting Earth in just a couple of hours. Due to this lack of time, they aren't going to finish Gamma's AI unit. They were never going to bother finishing it, as it just so happens to be standing right in front of them. Yeah, Maestro's gonna be piloting Gamma. God, even rewatching this scene, I am popping off at how cool it is. I'm hyped, again. With everyone ready and putting their last hopes on them, 
Maestro hops into the ultimate weapon. Let's do this. This fight is all about getting close to the Eclipse, using Gamma's Buster to destroy anything on your path to it. Upon getting close, you low-key start playing some punch out, bobbing and weaving while throwing in some punches. I don't even need to tell you that the music for this fight is amazing, do I? This fight isn't about being super hard or anything, it's about being an experience. Having this giant mech battle in a city against a being preparing on destroying the world, dodging all these different attacks as you run at it and start punching it out. But it's no use. Our enemy is unstoppable. As we continue to fight, Gamma becomes more and more damaged. Until upon reaching a certain point, we get bested. Gamma gets destroyed. The world's last hope has been defeated. Being destroyed, Maestro is spoken to by Duo, and in opposite of the Robenza scene, Maestro is reminded of how they chose to be a hero at every moment, always fighting for good, and as their body is broken, as everyone, from friends to foes, has put their fate into them, they are asked, Are you bound by your limitations? Or will you continue to fight? Eclipse tries desperately to stop Maestro with all of its attacks, but it does nothing. The only attacks that can deal damage are their claw swipes, but instead of losing HP out of their max HP, Maestro loses chunks of their health bar. It really gives you the feeling that they are giving the very last of everything that they have in this. That you're no longer playing as something alive, instead playing as an overflowing, powerful energy. An unstoppable energy that fights for the one thing that it has always believed in. Everlasting Peace.
Video games are awesome. What an incredible ending. I'm serious, stuff like this reminds me of why I love video games. Like what this game does with its characters, story, plot. I don't care if this is a fan game, because this, this is something so powerful that it holds on its own. When I think of these characters, I'm gonna think of how they're portrayed in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. Like these, these are Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch characters. This is something that can only be made from passionate people. Ten years of pure love have produced a creation that brims with brilliance. A masterpiece. Going into this, I, I was definitely not expecting what I got. It was such an incredible surprise. I didn't think a majority of this video would be me discussing what is probably the best campaign I have ever experienced in a first person shooter. Like this is an arena FPS and it manages to tell a story this good? I'm in awe at the fact that this was all done in a Doom source board. What a fun adventure this was. I'm so glad I decided to play through this. It completely shifted how I view Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch in the direction that this video went. And you know what? I hope you all enjoyed riding it along with me. Also, yes, Maestro is the best Mega Man character. Do not at me! The post credit scenes show Maestro being dropped off by the fading sun star as the sound of Wily's capsule plays in the distance. It is then revealed through mail that Wily saved them and is now once again scheming some sort of evil plan. Guess we're doing Mega Man 11. Can't wait to see Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch take Mega Man 11 and make something actually memorable from it. Those flames are fake, by the way. I don't really understand a lot of hate behind Mega Man 11. I thought it was fine. We also get some mail from AwesomeFan92, who we still don't know yet, but it seems they played a hand in the creation of Gamma. Who is this? Whatever. We chill out with Dr. Light and we're told to take a well deserved rest. And you know what? It's about time. Let's just hang around and have some fun before Wily plans on screwing everyone over again. Beach episode anyone? You know, I wonder what Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch devs are gonna do when they eventually run out of the main series Mega Man games to go off of. Because at this rate, they're starting to produce more than Capcom. Wait, is that a top hat? Who the? Magic Man's here to take us back to any previous chapter, and that's neat. He also appears on Cossack ship to allow us to delete all data from that chapter, so we can play through it again, buying different weapons and the such, and going through different planets, and going on a whole new adventure. It's probably pretty useful for a speedrun routing. But, it's time I talk about the secret bosses. Well, at least the ones I haven't mentioned yet. I already talked about the Wily Capsule and the Mega Man Killers, but there's more. If you revisit the shark boss from Mega Man 9, the door before the Proto Man fight will be open, where upon entering you'll be closed out as the game notifies you that the alternate boss has been activated. Now upon beating Proto Man again, instead of Maestro going to fight the shark plane while Mega Man gets Proto Man back to Light Slab, the scenario is flipped. Mega Man takes Rush and goes to attack the boss, while we're tasked with getting Proto Man to the lab. And how do we get there? Well, luckily, a mysterious hero shows up and offers us a ride on his truck. Whoa, this guy is cool. But just as we make our escape, ah, oh, crud, the cops! So now we're cruising down the highway in Auto 6 4 while the police are behind us. This fight is pretty unique as it's about just surviving a timer rather than fighting a boss with a health bar. The different fake men in the cars will pop out and start blasting with a couple of different patterns and dealing enough damage to them temporarily stops them. As the fight goes on, more enemies are introduced, such as the motorcyclist which Get out of my way. I'm a Get out of my way. and also some airborne fake man. The main idea of this fight is to not get overwhelmed because once that happens you'll just start getting blasted from all directions. Otto gives us some weapons throughout the fight, including Ballet Cracker, Ice Wave, and Dust Crusher. I think Dust Crusher and Ballet Cracker rule, as they basically one-shot the enemies. I think Ice Wave might be a gamer exclusive weapon because I couldn't find myself hitting the enemies with it. It's too slow and I'd rather be using a weapon that could hit all enemies, 
rather than just the motorcyclists. Auto provides you with a lot of healing and weapon energy, so you can actually stick with ballet trackers semi-comfortably with the ammo refills. In a fun twist, at one point, Auto tosses out some more copy weapons, including Gyro Attack and Remote Mine, but he overshoots and the Fake Man end up getting it instead. Pirate Mine Fake Man is probably an example of the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch boss moment where if you make one slip up you basically get melted. Only one shot gets shot out at a time, so it's imperative that you see where it's going and avoid it. I don't know what happens if it sticks you, but that might be a GG. I guess the attacks are random because I only saw the gyro attack attack twice and couldn't really gauge what it was doing. As we arrive at the end of the fight, Otto reaches a roadblock and full on crashes into it. I mean, alright, let's go. We wake up to find a single fake man, serving as the end boss. This is a surprisingly tricky fight, but it's also super fast. You both deal incredibly high damage to each other. All the fake man does is jump and shoot then reload after a while. I took the strategy of attrition. Whoever does enough damage first wins. It's a desperate struggle, but upon defeating them, several more fake men surround us before suddenly being called off, likely in concurrence with Mega Man destroying the shark plane. Otto wonders why that is. But considering that they may have already released Wily earlier, we can understand that the police force is probably corrupt, but everyone already knows that. Meanwhile, the cutscene of the destroyed shark plane plays as normal. We also get some mail from the mysterious hero. What a guy. And yeah, honestly, both of these fights at the end of that chapter are pretty cool. Maybe you can cry that the police chase is an auto-scroller or some dick, but I liked it. Maybe even more than the shark plane fight. I mean, there was always something happening, and as the fight escalates more and more things are introduced, it never got stale. I almost kinda wish that the player would be able to choose between taking Proto Man home or fighting the shark plane. Maybe that was the idea. I mean, why else would this boss exist? Okay, so this next fight is interesting. This whole time I have been eyeing that area above the waterfall at Light Slab, but I never knew how to get there. Well, as it turns out, weapons used in the virtual training area can be brought back out into the lab. Using one of these weapons, you can actually reach the top. Hmm. So for no reason at all, I think I'll use the Sakugarne, or, or Sakugarn, I don't care. Upon reaching there, we find some strange portal thing, where upon going into it... It's Quint, baby. The song used here is pretty cool as it changes throughout the fight. The fight itself is pretty long, having several phases involving being pushed through time. At one point even getting pushed to the beginning of the fight, where you see past Maestro getting bonked and you have to fight two Quints. If you die at any point, you get sent back to the beginning, so you have to be careful. I'd go more in depth on all the forms of this fight, but I'm gonna be honest, this video is just too long. But we defeat him. For those of you who don't know, Quint is actually Mega Man from the future. Judging by the text, he either came back because he was salty about Maestro being the main character, or Maestro being the main character was going to have some potentially bad effect on the world. I don't know why, but I felt kinda bad killing Mega Man. Like I don't know, isn't that a little messed up? But then again, I can't see Maestro doing any harm to this world, I mean, just look at them. Get real. So the last hidden boss we're talking about is going to require a bit of work to get to. Remember how I said that there was those hidden treasures all across the levels that we needed to decipher and revisit and yeah I didn't want to do this. As I said before I'd be more down if I wasn't marathoning because coming back to Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch after like years it would be fun to do a little scavenger hunt to these previous levels. But yeah I did it anyways. Pharaoh Man looks over the artifacts and translates them to planetary coordinates. Upon arriving there, we find these cool ruins where we use the artifacts to travel inside. 
It becomes obvious that we need certain abilities in order to travel the area, including the likes of Tornado Blow, Skull Barrier, and Lightning Bolt. This is a pretty neat level, because it's like a somewhat traditional level, more focused on having the right weapons to solve these puzzles. It's an interesting change of pace. We make it through, getting some pretty interesting lore bits about Maestro. Huh. Arriving in an arena, we meet the supercomputer, Ra Moon, sending out Ra Thor to fight us. And you might be wondering what the hell any of this is. And what you gotta understand is that the people who made Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch love Mega Man. So, there's this Japanese PS1 game called Super Adventure Rock Man. It's like one of those weird games where you spend most of the time watching cutscenes, and then there's like a minute of gameplay splitting things up. Funnily enough, it's a first person shooter too. Isn't that cool? Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch does a callback to the OG. Though I guess maybe it's more like a rail shooter, but without the rails. I was watching some gameplay and. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> As someone who thinks the world and characters of Mega Man is pretty cool, I actually kind of love this. Like I remember watching the Day of Sigma and thinking it was so cool, just because I get to see all these characters interact. Maybe that's why I love Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch so much. Wait, hold up. Why they got a monster truck? Dang! He is kind of cool, I guess. Okay, I'm wasting time. Basically, Wily finds this Temple of the Moon, which I think may be the same one that Maestro's at right now. He ends up falling like 8,000 feet. Yeah, this goes on for a while, but he meets Ra Moon, creates Ra Thor, and then plot plot plot, Ra Ra Ra, Ra Moon, Ra Thor, Ra Thor. And Mega Man comes through with the clutch and clips them. I wonder how that goes down. You know, this is basically how the fight goes down in Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch. Tossing out discs a lot, going in for the hug, and a giant spirit bomb exploding the ground into projectile waves. Halfway through, they get this shield thing going on that makes them pretty hard to hit with certain weapons. And yeah, reminder, this takes place in chapter 13, so we're allowed to bring whatever we want. I struggled at first, but then I remembered that Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch devs are followers of good game design, and that I could thusly use the abilities that I needed to traverse the area in order to dodge some of these attacks, and that made things easier. Other than that, I just focused on surviving and attacking while they charged up the spirit bomb. It's a bit of a tough fight, but overall, it's not half- oh, it's not over. Okay, so now we got the new yellow devil, or raw devil, and yes, they were in Super Rockman Adventure 2. Uh, so, do you remember a while back, how I said that Duo's fight was my second least favorite boss fight in Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch? Well, this is my first. I just don't like this boss. Like, it was bound that I would find a boss I didn't like eventually, so I'm at least glad it was an optional one. It's basically just a gimmick fight. It's super easy, but after a certain damage threshold, it randomly chooses one of these three attacks. This happens three times throughout the fight, and you have to face each of these three different phases. It basically tests you on weapons, such as using Tornado Blow to get up on a pillar and watch in amazement as you end the phase before the boss even attacks to using Skull Barrier to very easily parry this projectile. But this phase? This is where the problem is. I thought the idea was to use Lightning Bolt, but here's the thing. While these little blobs seem to come after you until you deal enough damage to the boss, the boss is meanwhile flying around doing circles in the air like it's in a goddamn jet plane, and I don't know if I'm scrubbing it up, but I could just not hit the boss in this phase, because once the blobs touch you, you're basically done. So I was coming out here with all these wild strats, like using ice wall to make a platform, but none of it worked. The worst part is, is that I'm out here swapping between like 80 different weapons. So while I try to crowd control the blobs, switching to an actual useful weapon to hit the boss is hard. You know how bad this got? I ended up using binds 
to start binding all my potentially useful weapons to keys on the keyboard. Like half my keyboard is now dedicated to Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch copy weapons. But even that wasn't enough. I would just sit there through these incredibly easy parts until I got to the blob part where I would get to cluelessly try to find some solution only to die and have to sit through it all again. I, I tried. I really did try. But I couldn't do it. I'll hold the L. I did not beat the boss. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's because I was marathoning everything, but I reached a breaking point. What happens after beating them is pretty neat though. Well, that's on you to find out. By just looking up another video. Dang. Actual skill issue. But yeah, might be on dipping out on the fight. I have my limits and I guess they were reached here. I'm just glad it happened to be on an optional fight. Regardless, that's about everything I have to say about the campaign. It rules. As you would imagine from the looks of it, it's probably not over yet. I'm not sure if there's exactly plans for covering Mega Man 11, I think there are. But I have seen some sprites of Acid Man, Tundra Man, Blast Man, etc. floating around. I'm not sure if they're officially made by the Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch team, but still. Would be interested to see what they do with Mega Man 11, considering all the cool stuff they did with the other games. So you may somehow remember that at the beginning of this video, I sort of hinted at having a pronounced focus on the multiplayer aspect of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch, and all the cool and unique mods that came from that, stuff you don't really see covered. Well, you see, that was actually a massive lie. I'll explain in a bit, but as I hinted at it earlier, Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch has been kind of overshadowing the Xandrina multiplayer community for a pretty long time. It's a pretty interesting scenario, isn't it? No other game has ever had that impact on Sandrinum. Like, this was a game with its own WAD and everything separate from Doom 2. And it's a popular WAD for multiplayer. Like, I don't think any other game in the Doom engine has ever done that before. It's just interesting that Sandrinum is Doom 2 and Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. Like, they're on the same level. It really goes to show that Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch really is just a game on its own. And what I'm trying to say overall is that there's a pretty good modding community for Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. Skins, stages, game modes, there's a lot to talk about. I'm a big fan of all the custom stages. With how much I played online, they're as memorable as the campaign stages. And there's some pretty stuff out here. Like stuff that the campaign can't even compare to a lot of the time. But then, we get to the gameplay mods. Cutman Mike actually made a fishing mod. It goes alongside Calm Hotel, which is basically the chill server. It's kind of in depth, like with rarities and fishes with actual effects, like you have to upgrade your rod, it's a whole thing. I kind of want to complete it someday, but I don't know. At the moment, sitting around an empty server just fishing over and over again makes me feel a special kind of sad. I guess it's kind of funny when there's others in the server, you know, just chilling out while people are out throwing hands on the side. Also, yes. This footage is from the Halloween version of this mod back in October. I've been trying to get this video out for that long. I don't know, it could be a fun stream thing. You know, just get a bunch of people on a server and just fish. Trading's kind of a big thing too. Like whenever I join a server, people are always asking for fish and such. Like low key, there's a, like a black market going down the parking lot behind the hotel. I tell ya, I've seen some stuff. But anyways, what about the fan made mods? From the community. Some of the most unique, fascinating games I've ever experienced, yet, I'm hesitant. No, in fact, I don't want to talk about them. Which is funny, because I actually have written full scripts on them, 
But then I realized something. I got standards. And baby, I gotta stick to my beliefs. What I'm trying to smoke is I just don't mess with the community. Case in point, do I want to talk about the overpowered class mod where each character is extremely silly in their own way? That Magic Man's gameplay involves healing off shooting a projectile with infinite range and no clip while simultaneously traversing the map in order to collect Yu-Gi-Oh cards in order to summon an army? Yes, I want to talk about that because that's hilarious. But then I have to talk about how one of the classes uses the F slur in the name of it. And I feel like that's a pretty good way to sum up the Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch community. Cool stuff by people I don't hang with. Like, I removed so much of the script that was just roasting the community, clans. Every time I gushed about these mods, I always found that there was just paragraphs of negativity within them. And I don't know. My passion isn't there. But. I guess I'll talk about CBM. I mean, I have to. I already brought it up a million times throughout the campaign portion. To my knowledge, CBM is probably the most popular Mega Man 8 bit deathmatch mod. It was made back in like 2010 and has only been growing. It's basically a mod that takes nearly every Mega Man character and makes them a playable class. Like ones based off copy weapons that takes the copy web and fleshes it out. Makes these characters play like they do in the games. For example, Danger Wrap is just an explosive bubble that moves up. But Burst Man? Burst Man can toggle his bubbles to hold from 1 to 3 bombs. Depending on which you have set, it affects the weight, damage, and arc of the bubble. Burst Man can also summon a bubble that traps enemies, allowing him to get free hits. But he can also get into the bubble himself and start flying around. And this is just one class. Out of over a hundred. And some of these classes are pretty in depth. Like Dr. Light is literally Ryu and has this whole meteor mechanic that can be spent on supers and EX moves. Rock is Mega Man Stalker, having different elemental balls with varying effects and arcs and different ways they travel. Sniper Joe kind of got like the kill streak thing going on like it's Call of Duty. Maestro's got some battle network thing going on, but I like to think they're the Avatar, and you get to choose between the four elements, and each element has three different types to it. Some of the classes even play similar to the bosses and characters in the campaign, such as evil robots attacks and the like. I feel like I could write an in-depth guide on nearly all these classes. In fact, at one point, I was working on one for what might be my favorite class. Not Maestro, Bad Box Art Mega Man. So this class is like Doom, but cooler. The weapons are like the Doom weapons, but all hitscan weapons are projectile based, and there's a catch. Like a true gamer, BBA pistol starts, and you gain weapons by filling up a meter through damaging opponents. So you have to buy the shotgun, chain gun, super shotgun, etc. It's a very fun class. The only problem is that with the current version, is that you don't really get to use a lot of the weapons. Like if you get anything past the super shotgun, the game is probably already over. Unless if you just pistol an AFK player until you get full meter, which if you're an honorable BBA player, you don't do that. And from what I heard, this character is pretty busted in deathmatch, so I don't know. And keep in mind that CBM is generally played in team last man standing, so one life. Because Doom's entire design thing is that some weapons are better in situations than others, and it was about using your arsenal to handle all situations. But then they introduced the super shotgun, so maybe not. What I'm trying to say is that while the later weapons are powerful, they aren't the best in every situation. I just wish I got to use more than the super shotgun. Okay, that might have been cap. You know I live and die by the super shotgun. Come on, come on. You know I'm fooling you. Come on, I'm fooling around. You know me, super shotgun. Hee <laughs> bow! Also, don't say skill issue. I kick dick with this class. I may be the last dope role player, but I'm also the coolest BBA player. And if you play in tournaments, or you're part of a clan, don't at me. And I bet Mega Man 2 is your favorite Mega Man game. Out of here! Also yes, there's a tournament scene. Arguably more popular than the casual scene, considering CBM is just owned by clans. CBM has a whole weird history to it. It basically just gets passed around from clan to clan. 
Apparently the last clan that had it allegedly just privated all their work from the public and essentially ran away with the mod. Which, if you know what clan that was, I'm gonna be honest, that's the least surprising thing to hear from them. Though it's also the same clan where the Dr. Light story came from. Can I talk about that? I had a whole script about it, it's pretty funny, but I'll give the shorthand of it. Okay, so there's dual servers, you know, 1v1 with spectators watching. Spoiler alert, kind of terrible for CBM, as some classes just counter pick each other. But I guess you can switch classes mid-match. Anyways, maybe I was like really depressed one day, maybe I hated myself and just didn't have much else to do. But I was, I was in a dual server, so I fought someone from the clan that owned CBM with Dr. Light, and I slapped them up. First duel I ever did. And keep in mind, these clan people were like, Ugh, I can't stand puppy players. I hate casuals. Let's just play some Priv instead. Let's play some private servers. Ooh, get on TeamSpeak. Like, th like they did this all the goddamn time. Every time they were in a public server, they just roasted people. And I was playing interesting, super aggressive, approaching from all directions, mixing them up. I'm a fighting game player, baby. Because meanwhile, they were playing like a Hot Pocket, sitting in a corner with Pirate Man. Regardless, the server was actually full of people of the clan watching our match. And when I won, whew, I could feel the seed. I could feel the mauled. Like, low key, I made sure my doors were locked, windows were sealed, because I was sure I was going to have an assassin stuck on me by midnight. They all stormed out of the server, and I felt like a main character in a Nickelodeon live-action movie who stood up to their bully and watched as him and his goons all walked away, promising revenge. And... revenge was given. Like, two days later, Dr. Light got annihilated. Nerfed to the ground. And I know it was me, because I ain't ever seen them update this mod so quick. This was an emergency hotfix. Public player beat our clan member. It's like when you play a fighting game against the game's creator, and you purposefully lose or play bad, because you're afraid that if you win, your character will get nerfed. And that's exactly what happened here. I played the devs, and they nerfed the character. I'm sorry, Dr. Light Mains. I don't even like playing him anymore after he got nerfed. It was that severe. But yeah, I have so much to say about CBM. All the changes, fixes where some classes randomly became overpowered. Good times. I suppose I'm kind of dissing the community by not talking about all these mods. Like, this was supposed to be the video that shone light to them. But then I mean, what multiplayer community? Like, I was actually struggling to get footage because I could never find people playing. I started taking pictures of the server list every day, different times of day too, it's weird. There was always a time where CBM would be popping, it used to happen every day. Hell, Xandernum in general is kinda looking dead. Like I'd actually say around 30 people playing online is pretty average, which I know you may think is small. And that's what I mean when I always say that I've been playing multiplayer Doom with the same exact people for over a decade. There's a very small amount of people actually into this, and everyone's basically played with one another. Like, I don't know, I haven't really been seeing much complex Doom or CBM like usual. It's just kind of empty. End of an era, I suppose. It's mostly just private servers. I remember back when public CTF was a thing. That was fun. The Friday Night Fragfest has been popping off again. I remember the time when, like, Nobody really bothered with those, so now I'm kind of tempted to hop on every Friday. I was really seeing some CBM being played in Chinese and South American servers, so that's pretty cool. But I don't know. I guess it's just time I move on from this part of my life, you know? Fun times though. Doom will always have a place in me, especially multiplayer Doom. But yeah. I guess I don't have much more to say on Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch, so let's wrap this up. Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch rules. A perfect showcase of the work that can be made when passionate fans come together, mixing in their own interests too. Like Doom and Mega Man? Pop off! But at the same time, I feel like Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch is more than just fan work. Not to say that's a bad thing, but that in some ways it seeks to be different. It's a story starring an original character, 
to the fact that this is a Mega Man fan game that isn't a 2D platformer. An idea was had here, and it was taken to full extent. Like if you pictured a Mega Man first person shooter, this is probably as accurate as a thought could get for it. But it's just so much more, you know? It's not just, what if we made Mega Man a first person shooter? It's, what if we put all these Mega Man weapons into a first person shooter? How would they translate? How would they play? How would these levels look as a first person shooter arena? How would these bosses play out in a first person shooter? And the final question they ask? How can I put my own spin on these ideas to create something beautiful? If it's not clear, y'all should play Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. It's a decade's worth of love, and the content brought forth from the campaign, and just seeing all the effort is worth experiencing, whether you're a Mega Man fan or not. Because maybe that's a sign when fan work is truly beyond just fan work, when it's something that anybody can enjoy. And if you like braving dangerous waters, try some multiplayer mods if there's even a server up with people in it. But I think I've said enough. It's about time to get back to uploading some videos. A lot shorter ones than this, okay? I got a lot planned and I got a list full. I'll catch y'all later. See ya. Oh, thank God it's finally over. This crap, God, God, it took so long. I don't really have a script here, so I'm just gonna say some thoughts. So I was mentioning like how this would be the start of the Mega Man retrospective, and uh, yeah it will be, but I don't actually have any plans on looking at the Mega Man games, maybe not even this year. See the thing about the re uh, retrospective is that I actually have to make sure I can run all the games, and I don't think I can run and capture footage of all the games, so I'm kind of just holding out on that. I mean Mega Man, that's a lot of games, like I want to cover everything, I want to cover like the I, I guess I'll cover the TV shows, the comics, oh god, that's so much. And of all the different series. And there's probably a lot more Mega Man games than you think. But hey, I covered the best one, am I right? So yeah, you know, I guess I'm kind of sorry for not uploading. And maybe sorry for myself, not for y'all. Because I actually really like uploading videos. Like, this is really fun to me, but I've been dealing with a lot of personal stuff. And I'm still kind of burning in hell at the moment. You know where to support me if you want to. But you know, maybe consider supporting the devs before supporting me. That's always kind of been my thing. But I plan on uploading some big stuff soon. Maybe I've already uploaded some big stuff. I uh, yeah, I hope you all are excited, I guess. I mean, I don't really think anyone cares. God, I'm, I'm on my crap again. There are people who care for my videos and crap, and that's cool. I mean, if you made it this far, yeah, I guess you do care. But let's be honest, I need to start making the videos shorter. Like, this crap, this crap's too long. I'd rather make more videos about more games that are a little shorter than less videos about less games. Like, you want me to upload, like, what, 12 videos a year? Like, I'm gonna talk about more games. And I don't need to do these, like, huge in-depth analysis. I, need to, I don't need to look at the whole entire story. I can just talk about the gameplay, do gameplay analysis, like... Why do I need to talk about the story when you can just play through it? Like, come on, you know? But yeah, that's basically all I gotta say. Uh, yeah, I... Good job, you made it so far. Like, this is a lot of... This is a long video. I hope you enjoyed it, though. I hope you found something out of it, yeah? Anyways, it's like... Late. <laughs> I'm gonna go to sleep, yeah? I'll catch y'all another day. Someday. See ya! I'm out of here!